Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Commuting Solutions' seventh annual Sustainable Transportation Summit. We hope you all had a chance to enjoy some delicious breakfast and do some networking before today's event. I'm Erin Fosdick, and I'm the president and CEO of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. I'm also a member of the Commuting Solutions Board of Directors. A big thanks to everyone for joining us as we dive into this year's theme of transportation innovations bringing people together. I want to thank the Longmont Museum and Cultural Center for hosting us today. Also want to take a moment to point out that any great event isn't complete without some technical difficulties. So you might notice a small screen. Um, we had hoped to have the larger screen down, but technology's not cooperating. So this might be a good opportunity to move um, to one of the front seats if you're having trouble seeing the screen, because we will be using that a little bit later. Here in Colorado, most of us are guilty of driving single occupant vehicles. Our days are really packed with responsibilities. We need to get to work. We have other duties that we need to accomplish. And sometimes the car is the most efficient way to do that. What if there was another more environmentally friendly option and a, and a reasonably convenient option that allowed us to spend our travel time and our commute time as we pleased instead of battling the dreaded front range traffic that I know many of us battled this morning getting here? An option that connected employees and residents to the places that they needed and wanted to be while also helping support placemaking and vibrant urban centers and corridors. The greenhouse gas effect of gas emissions per kilometer of railway transit is up to 80% less than cars. Today, on-road transportation is the second largest controllable cause of ozone air pollution behind only the oil and gas sector. During today's event, we're going to dive into the possibility of a dramatically improved transit options that provide opportunities for developing sustainable and resilient communities. We're going to learn from experts and policy leaders who are going to discuss how transportation innovations can change our environments day to day and bring people together. We wouldn't be able to host this summit without the generous support of the Commuting Solutions sponsors, so I want to take just a minute to recognize our 2023 presenting sponsors, Boulder County, the City and County of Broomfield, and the City of Boulder. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Colorado Transportation Investment Office, RTD, the Northwest Chamber Alliance, Google, Sterling Bay, and Elevations Credit Union. <laughs> Finally, a big thanks to our uh, silver and nonprofit sponsors. Commuting Solutions really appreciates your support. For 25 years, Commuting Solutions has been a strong advocate for multimodal planning and an advocate for the expansion of transit in our region. We're grateful to have the opportunity to advocate for the Northwest metro region in this capacity so that we can work to create even more attractive and accessible region that helps us bring businesses um, and residents and also helps reduce our impact on climate. Through our partnership with the Northwest Mayors and Community Commissioners Coalition, which represents the nine jurisdictions in our region, we've supported the implementation of rail for more than 20 years. Through our collective efforts and really through our persistence, we've been successful in achieving amazing regional investments together. Full implementation of Northwest Rail pro is promised to our region and it's a longstanding commitment that we still need to fulfill. We're really appreciative of the RTD board's commitment to fund the peak service Northwest Rail study to explore starting the service by operating three morning and afternoon trains from Longmont to Denver. We're also incredibly excited about the prospect of bringing together Northwest Rail service implementation with the possibility of front range passenger rail. Recognizing that the BNSF alignment is being considered as a corridor alignment, we will continue to be a strong supporter of this approach at the federal, state, regional, and local level. And I think it's a really, really exciting time for us to be expanding rail in Colorado. Our state has also started conversations about tying land use and development with transportation investments to address climate. Uh, during the 2023 legislative season, this was um, creating some political divides, but we anticipate that these important conversations are going to continue into the next legislative session. We're pleased today to have brought two expert speakers from Washington and Oregon who have implemented similar legislation in their respective states and are going to demonstrate the possibilities for us. We hope you learn a lot during the event today and are inspired by the opportunities that lie ahead for Colorado. 
With that, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Congressman Jonah Goose, uh, Colorado's second district representative in the U.S. House. Congressman Nagus is the chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. He serves on the Rules Committee and Natural Resources and Judiciary Committee and is the ranking member of the House Subcommittee on Federal Lands. We're thrilled to have him join us today. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming Congressman Nagus. Good morning. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, uh, for that very kind uh, introduction, a warm welcome. Uh, the work that Aaron and the folks at the Longmont Economic Development Partnership are doing every day to support our community here in Longmont is certainly much appreciated. We're grateful to you, uh, and I know our families, our workers, uh, and perhaps most importantly, our small businesses uh, in this community are very grateful for your efforts. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the executive director. Where's Aubrey? Where is she? Where is she? She's way in the back, of course, running the show as usual. Let's give her a round of applause as well for all of her hard work. She's been a great partner, a great friend uh, to our office, and it's been a real privilege to be able to work with her uh, these last few years on some really important projects, which I'll talk a bit about. Uh, I thought that, you know, perhaps kind of framing the conversation for today, understanding uh, the distinguished uh, group of uh, speakers and panelists that you'll hear from, of course, uh, Boulder County Commissioner uh, Claire Levy, who's doing a phenomenal job, uh, and your uh, wonderful representatives that you've brought from different parts of the country, USDOT and, and experts in their respective fields, uh, that I might just be able to frame the conversation a bit. And as I think about the work that this fine group of individuals is called to do, in my view, it requires two things, perseverance and partnership. And I was just talking to one of your board members about those two qualities. And I'll explain why. First, I mean, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, there was a recent article in the Denver Post, which is three days ago, uh, that polled Coloradans from across our state. And without fail, one of the top issues uh, that percolated uh, to the very top for folks concerned about their daily lives was traffic and transportation infrastructure being one of the top concerns that every Coloradan uh, feels and experiences, whether they live in Colorado Springs, Southern Colorado, or up here in Northern Colorado. And with our state's population growing each year, uh, we know that this issue is going to only increase in prevalence. I've lived in Colorado uh, for 35, 34 years, since I was five years old, and the state has changed dramatically over that period of time. Population growth has been exponential. It has taxed the infrastructure of our state, and it is clear that we are at a, a crossroads, an inflection point where we now need to make some tough choices. But there are great opportunities as well, if we're willing to build the partnerships that are necessary and if we're willing to persevere, to be persistent in that partnership. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, in the last year, we have seen millions of dollars brought to bear across our state and across the country as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law. That law, is the most significant investment in our nation's infrastructure since the days of Dwight Eisenhower and the modern highway system was first conceived of before many of us were alive. Uh, not gonna say who wasn't alive or not alive back then, but uh, a law that is having a dramatic impact on our state. And it is by virtue of the fact that we built a partnership in the United States Congress across party lines and that the president was persistent in making the case that it was time for our country to make a generational investment in an infrastructure. And that meant, yes, multimodal. It meant broadband infrastructure, infrastructure of all types. That ultimately is what was necessary to get it across the finish line. And it is having real impacts in our state. The best example, of course, uh, is the $25 million raise grant that we were able, with your help, to secure for Highway 119. It's a big deal. And the, for me, it's a great example of those two qualities, partnership and perseverance. With respect to the former, you know, most of the raise grant proposals that our office has uh, worked on in the past, and I think most members of our delegation have historically uh, participated in, are usually from one jurisdiction. It's rare that you have a grant proposal like the Highway 119 grant proposal where it's necessary 
to develop connections across multiple jurisdictions. The Boulder County Commissioners, the City of Longmont, the City of Boulder, RTD, Northwest Mayors, City and County of Broomfield, everyone all in on one vision. It is also rare to have a level of persistence that we saw from this particular coalition because of course many of you in this room, in this ballroom worked, or auditorium rather, worked on this particular grant and know full well that it took us a couple of tries. But we were persistent in our advocacy. Uh, I was, uh, many of you know, we, I have a five-year-old daughter and a three-month-old son, so to the extent that I sound a little bit tired, it's because I was on baby duty last night, so drinking a lot of coffee this morning, because uh, he was up quite a bit. But a few months ago, two months ago, right after he was born, uh, we finally had a, a, sort of our first day out where we could take Joshua, our son, and so we were driving up to Lyons. They have a wonderful park up there that Natalie, our daughter, loves. And as we were driving up, my wife and I and the kids, I got a call. And it was from an unavailable number, so I knew it was you know, either a telemarketer or someone important from Washington, D.C. <laughs> and Andrea said, like, you know, don't answer the phone. I've got to answer the phone. It was a Sunday. So I answered the phone. And she could tell that I was talking to somebody important. And she could see this huge smile on my face. And she's thinking, like, oh, this must be, you know, maybe it's the vice president calling. Or, you know, this is so, some... Uh, and as I get off the phone, I was like, why are you smiling so much? Why are you so excited? Well, we just got this raise grant, and it was Secretary Buttigieg calling to say uh, that uh, this raise grant would be approved for uh, the Highway 119 project. It's like, that's why you're smiling? Not that Andrea, my wife, doesn't care deeply about <laughs> Highway 119. Uh, but for me, it was a big deal, and the reason, in addition to the, the fact that it's going to have a real impact for the better for generations to come, is because of the persistence that it required of this community, uh, of folks who continually made the case to our office, made the case to officials back at USDOT in Washington that this was a priority worth investing in. And that level of persistence, that level of partnership is what was necessary to get it across the finish line. There are more opportunities to come. We're gonna talk a lot, or I believe you all will be talking a lot today, about uh, rail. We've called on the Department of Transportation uh, in Washington to include Colorado's Front Range Passenger Rail Project in the Federal Rail Administration's newly constructed Corridor Identification and Development Program, which is a program that was created as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. I know that we have representatives from Amtrak who have joined us here today. It's another example, a game changer, that will require partnership and persistence. And this community certainly knows a lot about those two qualities, those two skills that I think are required of us to tackle these big challenges that face us ahead. So know that you'll have a partner in our office, uh, that we will continue to be a champion for this community and for the multimodal transportation needs that the community is going to require so that ultimately uh, our children collectively have a wonderful community that they inherit where they can live their dreams and raise their families, start their businesses and more. And as long as we apply perseverance and partnership, I'm confident we'll be able to do all that and more. So thank you all for all that you do. Thank you for all that I know you'll continue to do. And let us know how we can be of help. Have a great morning. Thank you so much, Congressman Nagus, for taking some time to speak with us today, and thanks for your continued support and persistence um, in supporting our region. Now I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Mayor Joan Peck, who's gonna provide a brief welcome message to all of our guests. Mayor Peck was elected as Longmont's mayor in uh, 2021 after serving as a council member for six years. She's lived in Longmont for nearly 46 years and is really a tireless champion for Longmont. Um, her policy focuses include transportation innovation and climate protection. Please joining, join me in welcoming Mayor Joan Peck. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the 7th Sustainable Transportation Summit, and welcome to our incredible museum and city. Um, we're so pleased to have you attending this summit in our community and we appreciate commuting solutions and the Longmont City, I'm sorry, for making this event possible. I am not really a great speaker, so hang in there with me. 
Transportation and the vision of rail and Highway 119 serving Longmont and all of the municipalities on the Northwest Corridor is a topic that I and the Longmont City Councils have been pursuing for years. We can't wait for the rest of the region to be connected to Longmont. It's incredibly important for us as the second largest city in Boulder County to be part of making the vision of rail a reality. I'm also a member of the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board, and I'm eager to advance this significant investment for Colorado. It is my belief that if it was not for the support of our governor, Jared Polis, and Congressman Nagoose, advocating for both the Fast Tracks Northwest Corridor and the Front Range Passenger Rail District, Longmont would still be in a discussion with RTD as a, an investment that is un unattainable. We're proud to be working with the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition and Commuting Solutions at a federal and state level to heighten our advocacy efforts. And we appreciate the support of, the support of our congressional members for their support of passenger rail service to Colorado. We hope you have a productive and enjoyable moment at, our, at today's events. And thank you for being here and for your interest to advance uh, rail and transportation for our region. Enjoy the day and the rest of the summit. Thank you, Mayor Peck, for that welcome message and thanks for all your support for Longmont and the Northwest region. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Chris McShane, Commuting Solutions Board Chairperson. Chris is a Senior Vice President and Private Banker at InBank. Please welcome me in join in please join me in welcoming Chris. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, uh, rail has been a longstanding commitment to our region through the RTD Fast Tracks ballot issue uh, Metro Denver uh, voters approved back in 2004. And while those first six miles started service about five years ago, you know, connecting Denver Union Station to Westminster Station, the rest of that 40 mile corridor has not moved forward and would not for several decades unless we identify new funding, new partnership, and uh, pursue new vision. Uh, we're excited to have convened many stakeholders who are intimately involved with the exploration of expanding passion to rail service in Colorado. To that end, there's an exciting opportunity that I think we all should support enthusiastically, and that is the creation of Front Range Passenger Rail. Concurrently, as you'll hear from Ms. Johnson, the RTD is exploring a peak service Northwest Rail that would provide a few trips in the AM and a few in the, in the afternoon to start the passenger rail service between Denver uh, and Union Station and Longmont. We at Commuting Solutions envision a reality <clears throat> where there is a partnership between Front Range Passenger Rail, RTD, Amtrak, and the Colorado Department of Transportation, where both interregional and regional service is provided to our communities along the Northwest Rail Corridor. Would that not be an amazing accomplishment for our region? Uh, we can be optimistic about making this vision a reality, as today we will learn about how the state of Washington successfully implemented a similar approach. We are also excited to share insights into Oregon's transportation and how land use legislation can serve as a conversation starter, um, specifically as it relates to Colorado's um, Senate Bill 213 discussion. This is an exciting time to be imagining these bold possibilities for Colorado. Together, we should think beyond what we have experienced thus far and to bring forth what um, and, and to have a vision and to bring forth what previously may have seemed impossible. So thank you all for being here again today. Thank you, Chris, for that welcome message and thanks for your continued leadership with Commuting Solutions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of the seventh annual Sustainable Transportation Summit. Julie Meredith serves, as, serves the Washington Department of Transportation as the Assistant Secretary of Urban Mobility, Access and Mega Programs. Julie has been with WashDOT for more than 30 years. In her current role, she oversees transportation investments of more than $6 billion, 
bridge and highway tolling, transportation planning, and regional transit coordination. Within these groups, her portfolio includes designing and constructing mega programs, operating complex toll roads, and planning integrated transportation systems, coordinating with regional transit agencies, all with a vision to lead the transformation of mobility and support the agency's goal to build a resilient transportation system that is safe, sound, and smart. We are thrilled to have Julie join us from Seattle for this event. We'll have about 10 minutes after the presentation for audience question and answer, so please um, stick around for that and think about what questions you have for Julie. So with an eye towards future sustainable transportation in Colorado, there's so much to learn from the innovative transportation efforts being undertaken in Washington. Please join me in welcoming Julie to the stage. I was worried I wasn't going to be able to see, but it's really bright. So I, I'm so glad to be here. She said, my name is Julie Meredith, and Congressman Nagoose sort of took my uh, thunder because what you're going to hear a lot about for me is partnership, and perseverance is also a good word. So there, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to share what we've been doing in transportation. There's a lot of land use and transit coordination that Washington State is doing specifically where I work in the Puget Sound region, where a few of our major metropolitan areas are located, including Seattle and Bellevue. Ew, I can't see the slides. But in 2022, we at WashDOT combined our offices of urban mobility and access divisions, which includes the management of mobility, our planning organization, with our regional transit coordination division and our toll divisions. With the large scale transportation programs called our mega programs. These divisions and programs together are responsible for planning and delivery of some of the largest and most complex transportation efforts that Washington State has ever undertaken. As an organization, we look at all phases from planning and design through construction with the vision forward on how people travel now and how they will travel in the future so that we can support our economy, mobility, and the quality of life of Washingtonians. One of our key strengths is our focus on partnerships. Through strong partnerships, we're better able to plan, finance, design, construct, and operate the multimodal corridors and integrated systems. Both the Regional Transit Coordination Division and our Management and Mobility Divisions are located in the same organization in Puget Sound so that we can better partnership with the partners we need to, those at the, at the planning organizations in those locations. The central Puget Sound region, which as I said, includes Seattle, Bellevue, and areas to the north, south, and east. And if I could see the slide, it would be in orange on the map. It has a current population of over 4 million people and is expected to grow by another 1.8 million by 2050. One of the things that's really set the stage for coordinating transportation, land use, and transit planning in the region in Washington State's Growth Management Act. This act requires all cities and counties in the Puget Sound to adopt comprehensive plans to manage their growth over the next 20 years. Cities and counties are currently in the process of updating their comprehensive plans. They have a deadline for completing their plans by December of 2024, and they will look to manage the growth from 2024 to 2044. The Growth Management Act requires that they conduct an update every 10 years, so they will complete their updates at the end of next year and will be required to complete another one in December of 2034, which as we know, is a blink of an eye in transportation. Cities and counties are specifically required to include elements in their plan for land use, transportation, housing, capital facilities, and utilities, all which must be supportive of and consistent with each other. There are more recent requirements for comprehensive plans to include climate change and resilience considerations. 
This growth management framework gives all local, regional, and state agencies a clear picture of what's being planned in each community. It also gives WashDOT the opportunity to engage early in the planning process and partner with agencies to work towards common goals. One of the things that's unique in our partnership and coordination with local agencies in the Puget Sound is that we are all agreeing to work towards a regional agreed to uh, vision where population and growth will occur. The regional municipal planning organization, the Puget Sound Regional Council, that from now on I'm gonna call PSRC, has adopted the regional growth strategy. And this strategy takes a step further than GMA, the Growth Management Act requires. It directs growth to go within higher density areas in high capacity transit stations. The overall goal of this strategy is to link growth and development with high capacity transit investments in the region, providing a more multimodal travel option shed. We have fostered a strong partnership with our regional transit agency partner, Sound Transit. Sound Transit is the regional authority for the area responsible for planning, implementing, constructing, operating high capacity, high capacity transit in the region, including bus rapid transit, light rail transit, and a heavy rail transit that operates in the north-south in, in the vicinity. As an agency, Sound Transit is in a period of significant planning and growth. On the left side of the side, you can see their current light rail system, which is about 20 miles. And on the right side is their expanded system, more than tripling to 60 miles worth of light rail and a parallel BRT system on the east side. There will be over 100 bus rapid transit and light rail stations either on to or adjacent to wash dock facilities in the future. The Regional Transit Coordination Division works closely with Sound Transit to advance multimodal tra transportation in partnership, both in planning and informing agreements for operation and maintenance alongside wash dock facilities. And I should say that the expansion that Sound Transit is undertaking requires a strong partnership and in, it reflects a 40 to $50 billion investment in the system. Just an example of the strong partnership we have with Sound Transit. As some of you know, working in transportation, uh, many of us are experiencing increased costs uh, across the corridors, higher than estimated contractor proposals. Can I help you? Oh, oh no, I, I don't need to okay. see it. Thank you. So. <laughs> On a recent project, we had a project that was uh, included bus rapid transit, which is Sound Transit's component in conjunction with the development of our express toll lane systems on Interstate 405. We shared the cost of the program, 80% being paid for by Washington State DOT, 20% by Sound Transit. The bids came in significantly higher than either agency anticipated. Washington and Sound Transit needed to work together to determine what the next steps were, how to make decisions in a timely fashion to meet the contractor contract dates. In addition, we had very different governance structures to work through. It was only because of our strong partnership that we were able to coordinate decisions in a timely manner and agree to move forward to execute that contract. So as a result, you'll see express toll lanes and the bus rapid transit system meet the goals and deliver on time for the citizens. In addition to supporting the regional growth strategy through our partnership with Sound Transit, we also partnership, partner with the Puget Sound Regional Council through our management division. The management of mobility division reviews local plans in King and Snohomish counties, two of the most populated counties in the region. Reviewing the plans allows us to provide comments and influence. So we look for project consistency between WashDOT and the local agencies. We look for complete streets. How did they address climate change and equity? And we make sure that they have a robust engagement plan so that everyone can contribute early in the planning process. While this is one of the primary ways we have, it gives us an opportunity to provide input on land use. 
We are limited at Washington State DOT because we do not have formal authority to approve or deny the plans. So again, it's through the strong partnerships that we have that we can influence the process. Some of the examples I, I'm gonna offer on this, uh, an example in Spokane, Washington, which is on the east side of our state. Um, the city had annexed a rural area way back in 1981 and as the annex process, they offered and planned to build promised arterial streets. After development and with even more housing proposed and without building the arterial streets they'd planned, safety issues were identified where the local um, community was really having issues accessing WashDOT system. Safety improvements were needed. So rather than the $40 million arterial improvements that were necessary and identified up front but never built, a $500 million interchange was proposed by the local jurisdiction. WashDOT, in response and after much consideration and discussion, proposed potential median closures along the state highway if any more development was uh, approved. And this allowed us to gain a seat at the land use table, and we were able to partner with land use groups and the city for a more reasonable and measured build-out plan. And this is an example where the citizens share a higher cost that could have been avoided had transportation um, considerations been more involved up front in the land use decisions. Another example, which is a more recent example on the, in Puget Sound, um, is where a local municipality is proposing a future land use change, a change to the vision that we've all agreed to, meaning the proposed growth that they would like is outside the current growth boundary. In addition to concerns that Washout has about it varying from the agreed to vision, it has the potential to impact our facilities that directly border the change. We are currently constructing an interchange, more than 200 million, which was a supported investment by the local community and, uh, and a very desirable upgrade to the interchange, that if the city is successful in changing the boundary, we will be making the interchange potentially obsolete by the time they do the, the change in the growth. This is something that I'm watching very closely and that we, really shows why alignment with the regional growth strategy is critical for all parties. It emphasizes the importance of a regional growth strategy because without it, the pattern that I just described would be more common. Not all of our coordination and review of the land use plans is to correct something that we see going wrong. Through land use review, we are able to work with the agencies to influence the policy decisions that impact travel choice and the travel experience. Review and provide comment letters, on growth alternatives that the cities are considering as part of the environmental impact statement processes. And in this role, we identify and support the alternatives that is most closely aligned with WashDOT's transportation goals. As an agency, we see several additional ways to advance the integration of land use and transportation decision making. Roger Millar, our Secretary of Transportation at WashDOT, is committed to changing the future of mobility and is a leader in, some of the, in the country in many of these things that I'm gonna talk about. He has advocated that transportation needs to be in the land use business. Transportation and land use is tied to housing decisions because having to travel long distances to find affordable housing <clears throat> becomes an affordable housing and transportation issue. Being able to live and work near transit centers allows people to grow personally and professionally without being stuck on our interstate for many hours. Developments and expansion without transportation involvement often leads to more expensive fixes for WashDOT and our customers after the fact. And we need to make it easier and safe to shift to shorter trips and partners with cities and counties up front on these goals. We see the single most impactful way to influence vehicle miles traveled 
is to make smart land use decisions. Transit and bicycling enhancements and other strategies do play a role, but none affect vehicle miles traveled as much as land use. We can grow the economy, for example, but when that means that people have to live further and further from where they work becomes a problem. Another key factor we have, the zoning. Housing is not affordable across Washington State, and nationally we know that this is a trend, and land use decisions play an important factor. Too much land is limited to just single family housing. Some people can af cannot afford to live near the activities and the work that they need to participate in. They live further and further away and are often forced to drive as opposed to riding transit, walking, bicycling, any other mode. It's not equitable and it creates more traffic and more pollution. These are the trends that we see as a transportation agency where we being forced to address a land use problem through transportation systems. In addition to opportunities for better connecting land use and transportation planning, we are incorporating resilience and equity into our planning and decision making. As an agency, our strategic plan provides the vision, mission, and values that guide our decision making. The plan is focused on three key areas, resilience, workforce development, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as you can see, these goals overlap each other. Each one bleeds into the other one, and it's important to note that they work together. For this, for this day, I'm going to talk about resilience and equity, which are embedded in our future planning. We've defined resilience as the ability to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. For our agency, that means being prepared for anything that comes our way, disruptions of any kind that affect the movement of people and goods throughout our state. In Secretary Millar's words, a resilient transportation system also needs to be safe, sound, and smart. Our resilience goal states that we will plan and or invest resources to improve our ability to mitigate, prepare for, respond to emergencies, combat climate change, and build a transportation system that provides equitable services, improves multimodal access, and supports Washington's long-term resilience. And if anybody looks that up, it, we borrowed heavily from FHWA on that as well. So we take good ideas. We want to reduce our transportation system's contribution to climate change. And as you heard here today, transportation is one of the major contributors to, the, to our state's greenhouse gas emissions, almost 50%. We also want to proactively build, operate, and maintain a transportation system that can withstand the effects of climate change and be an equitable system that all can access. With this goal in mind, we are thinking about resilience as we look at our system and applying safe, sound, and smart principles to our expansion considerations. This includes new systems and technologies, ramp meters, express toll lanes, other options to explore like what happens when automated vehicles are out, what happens to the notion of mobility as a service, what about other modes like bicycling and walking, and at a multi-regional level, this means thinking about crossing modes, including highways, exploring high-speed rail, and incremental improvements to Amtrak. What about aviation? Thinking about all those modes. This is the thinking that led to the high, Cascadia High-Speed Rail and I-5 program. The Cascadia Mega Region, connecting metropolitan Portland, the greater Seattle area, metropolitan Vancouver, British Columbia, these areas have experienced significant growth in recent years, with more than 3 million people expected to move into the region in the next 30 years, a more than 30% increase. Our regional leaders have an opportunity to choose how they respond to this growth. We are collaborating with the state of Oregon, the province of British Columbia, the private sector, and regional partners to explore how high-speed, high-capacity corridor can better connect the Cascadia Mega Region, 
high-speed rail, along with other investments in transportation, can have significant potential to link the metropolitan areas of Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, British Columbia, and to transform our region and make it more resilient. Last year, Washed Out started to work and begin a master plan for the I-5 corridor from Canada to Oregon. At the same time, the ultra-high-speed ground transportation study was in the process of submitting a grant application for federal funding to advance planning and engineering work for a high-speed rail connection between the areas of Portland and Vancouver. We see an opportunity to integrate these two planning efforts into one program. The program will work closely with WashDOT's aviation division to understand how air mobility can play a role in supporting future mobility within our state. This is the first time in my 30 plus year career that we have been looking at all these modes together in agency and it will require an even stronger partnership with our local, state, and federal partners, as well as our tribes, the communities we serve, and private industry. I look at it as how do we keep I-5 resilient? It is the backbone of our state. And how do we preserve it and grow it to be the asset it can be while we look to the next 75 and 100 years and how can we support our economy, mobility, and maintain or improve our quality of life? The engagement will be coordinated effort. We will work closely with our municipal planning organizations and our local communities to talk about what kind of future they want and the role that land use planning will have in that. Sound Transit will also be closely involved in planning for multimodal connections. We are being challenged to think long term and deliver on the state's transportation investments. But in order to plan the future, we need to think bold now. It's an incredible opportunity to advance our goals, to think of sustainable growth, to be resilient and have equitable engagement. I know it's going to be a challenge. It's the thing that keeps me going here at Washdot, and I'm looking forward to the challenge. So thank you again for inviting me here. It's been great to hear. And um, perseverance is what it's going to take for all of us to bring these things to fruition. So thank you. Thank you so much for that yeah. inspiration. It's great to see that, that you're doing so much in Washington. We have some time for questions. Um, we can use a microphone if needed, but if you can just raise your hand, questions for Julie. We'll have about 10 to 15 minutes. And if, if you don't have questions, I have questions, but I want to make sure we give the audience time. Yes. We'll see if we can hear you in the back. Um, you know, it's, it's really in its early stages, but we were looking at high-speed rail or Earl to high-speed rail, so up to 250 miles an hour. And, and, and I will say, we are a long way from decisions on high-speed rail. This is the very beginning, but it's, it's so exciting to be here, and it will advance if we're successful through the federal grant program. So we're looking forward to those decisions, which would happen later this year. You know, it's Amtrak, so I believe it's diesel, but it's not, it's not in my wheelhouse so much. It is Amtrak, yep. I think it came from Smart Growth America. Yep. Thank you, Julie. John Putnam from the USDOT. I had a couple questions about um, autonomous vehicles and enhanced air mobility and other aviation integration. Interested in how Washington DOT is thinking about how you'd make those support solid transit and rail as opposed to being competitors. Double edged sword, 
it there? And then is there some other methods of thinking about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Because we have never done planning in consideration of air mobility before. But Washington State is looking at a significant growth in air travel and our airports are struggling to meet those needs. Um, so we're gonna be looking at how, how does air mobility serve, say, within the state of Washington? And how does, how does a light rail system, how does a high speed rail system, how do those partner with each other so that they, we can make the most of the investments? So we don't overlap. And what does that mean for the footprint? So we wanna make smart choices about where we apply our funds. We also want to make uh, smart choices for climate change. So we want to make multimodal connections easier and more efficient for everybody. And you can tell that the footprint at an airport is very significant. So how do we serve and make the most out of those connections? We, we don't have any formal governance with those partnerships, but I'll say Sound Transit started as an agency in 1996, and you know, how do you have a partnership and not overlap? Um, I think for the first five years as an agency, we knocked elbows with Sound Transit for quite a while. Um, we had to learn to work with FTA as the Washington State DOT. That was uh, news to us that there was another federal agency out there. Um, so we worked, with, it took a few years to figure out how to work with FTA and FHWA. But I will say that our staff can, can converse now with Sound Transit about the needs for light rail and what their footprint is. They can talk to us now about what we need to make our systems function. And, and I'll say that doesn't mean we agree. That, that doesn't mean we just all sing on the same sheet all the time. But I think we can have really good conversations and we both know and understand the other side. That's, that's a partnership. And when we have a shared vision, um, our leadership is really supportive of light rail in the area. We're really supportive of transit. And that makes my job easy when we need to partner. Other questions? Do you have, yes. Andy Carson, Portland Rail. How is the current system funded or has been funded if you're able to speak to this? And what kind of funding are you looking for for the expansion moving forward? Uh, which, which system? So Sound Transit is funded uh, through uh, a tax in the Puget Sound region. So they have a sales tax for them. Uh, and it's funded uh, up to, I think it's between 40 and 50 billion to expand the system out. Uh, when high speed rail that I was talking about, we applied for two, two grants we won't know until the end of the year whether we were successful. I mean, fingers crossed that we're uh, gonna be able to be successful through that process. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, no. Yeah, so uh, you work for CDOT, so Washington, probably like CDOT, is broken up into regions, six regions. Those regions do planning, they do maintenance, they do capital delivery, and when something happens, the focus is on that something. If there's a slide, all the geotechs are over there fixing the slide. If there's a bridge issue, they're right there. Maintenance and preservation take first front. Operations take first front. And that perseverance it takes to deliver a mega program, you've got to be singular focused on just the delivery. You can't run off and do the pass clearing 
because you've got to do your work on the mega program. So by having a team that's simply focused on the delivery of this program, that's what it takes to deliver those systems. So on the program, you'll see the SR520 Bridge Replacement HOV Project. I started that program on that program in 2003 when they passed a transportation package. Um, it took probably six or seven years since 2003 for us to get a half a yes on that project. And it was to replace a bridge that was vulnerable. It really needed uh, to be addressed. Uh, so it's with that singular focus that it takes to gain the how to get to yes and then to implement it. So those projects that were listed as mega projects, um, 520 is a $5 billion program, 405 is a $3 billion program, the Gateway Project is another $3 billion. I mean, these are significant investments in the system that address um, either seismic vulnerability needs, 520 was a wind, weather, seismic vulnerability need. They all include multimodal features, are heavily transit features, or the Gateway Program is um, doing connections to our ports for our economy, and all of our mega programs include uh, a portion of tolling or express tolling as part of them. So we're, we're trying to do the look forward to the future. I think we have one more question that I saw. Washington State just uh, passed the HEAL Act and the PEAR Act. Both have equity portions of it. So we'll be looking at all the investments we do through an EJ lens, which we just, we're just beginning that today. We were required to update our strategic plans, which I was a part of. I was part of updating it for resilience on the goal. We had other teams who updated it for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in workforce. But we updated it for EJ in January so that we have that uh, throughout our system. I, I will say that one of the things we've been doing at Washington State, since you asked, is looking at our hiring practices. So we make sure that we, uh, we look at the candidates we got. We looked at, made sure we did outreach as broad as we could be. Um, I, I will say we struggle to get candidates um, senior level candidates that meet our diversity and equity standards. Hasn't, I, we're far more successful when we're getting um, I, uh, less experienced candidates through the door. So the young people that come to us are actually helping us um, be more diverse, um, which helps I think in our thinking process going forward. Um, so all our investments starting this year over, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's over a million dollars. We'll need to go through an equity assessment to see how we do, uh, how we meet the goals of the state. And we also have an outreach plan that talks about how we do equity engagement. So on State Route 167, we did a new master plan for that corridor, and we put together a specific group that looked at equity in communities, equity in access, equity in, um, the neighborhoods. So we specifically took all our ideas to that group and we said, where did we have gaps? So they helped us define it. Another thing we've been doing is it's a challenge for everybody to get to the table. So there are opportunities for us to help fund their time at the table. We take that chance too. So we're trying everything to get everybody's voice at the table to give us input. Thank you so much, Julie, for Great. sharing Thank your you. experience on these important topics. <laughs> I'm so glad I could come here. Yes. And thanks so much to the audience for your thoughtful questions. Um, that was really great. The good news is we have a break now. Everyone can get up and stretch. Um, we have a snack out in the Swan Atrium. This is where you had breakfast. Um, we do ask that you be mindful of the time. We'll start back in about 15 minutes, so please be back in your seats at 945. You'll just walk right out the door here. 
um, take the time that you need to refresh, um, say hi to your colleagues, and we'll meet back here in 15 minutes. I think the bright light on my face is our cue to go ahead and get started again. So thank you for, for coming back after that break. I hope you had a chance to enjoy some networking, some refreshments. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce the next portion of our event, the expert panel. The panel will be led by our moderator, Boulder County Commissioner Claire Levy. Commissioner Levy was elected to the Board of County Commissioners in 2020. In 2023, Commissioner Levy serves as the chair of the Board of County Commissioners. Her other leadership roles include serving on the Board of Directors for the Denver Regional Council of Governments, serving as a member of the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition, and serving on the Board of Directors for the Front Range Passenger Rail District. Please join me in warmly welcoming Commissioner Levy. Well, hello and, um, and welcome. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to moderate this uh, amazing panel that we have here. Um, as Erin um, said in, in her introduction, uh, I'm Boulder County Commissioner Claire Levy. And uh, as chair of the Board of County Commissioners and um, as our representative to the Northwest MCC and also uh, a member of the Board of Directors of the Front Range Passenger Rail District. So uh, putting all of those together, you can see that I um, am spending a lot of time on um, both local and regional transportation issues. And I'm very passionate about delivering passenger rail for our Northwest region and pleased to serve as the moderator for today's panel. Um, we're excited to convene stakeholders this morning to discuss the future of intercity passenger rail in Colorado and specifically along the Front Range. Um, I would like to thank everyone uh, for your participation today and um, in advance I'll thank our expert panel for their contribution to the discussion. So to start our um, expert panel portion of today's event, uh, we'll just take a few minutes for each panelist to just quickly introduce themselves um, with your name and your title. And uh, we'll start with John Putnam, who currently doesn't have a title, but uh, you can tell us what your former title was. Thank you, Claire. Um, as Claire mentioned, I am John Putnam. Um, I'm just going to go by Transportation Geek. Uh, right now, um, I am uh, between positions most recently I was general counsel of the United States Department of Transportation. Uh, before that, I was environmental programs director for the state, and then before then, it had a couple decades of service working with uh, states and local governments on transportation and environmental issues. Yep, thanks, John. David? Good morning, my name is David Singer. I'm with the Colorado Department of Transportation. My title is assistant director for passenger rail. I've been with CDOT for 20 years, and I've worked on quarter development, um, US 36 when I first got started, and moved on to the I-70 mountain corridor. So always kind of drawn to exciting, complex quarter projects. Great, thank you, David. Deborah. So first and foremost, thank you very much to Commuting Solutions for the opportunity to engage with you on an issue in which I'm very passionate about. Um, my name is Deborah Johnson. My functional title is the general manager and CEO of the Regional Transportation District, but I like to qualify myself as a person in the people business, recognizing that public transport unleashes people from their limitations and provides access to opportunities. I've been in the public transportation arena now going into my 32nd year. I've had the opportunity to work in a myriad of different communities across the country, ranging from Washington, D.C. to various communities in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as Southern California, now here in the metropolitan in Denver region. And this is the seventh transit agency for which I work, and I pride myself on being the voice of the voiceless, bringing the, the voice from the bus stop into the boardroom, which we'll pretend this is one, and we'll speak about that today. So thank you very kindly for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Deborah and Dennis. All right, good morning, everyone. And I'd also like to thank Commuting Solutions for, for having me here and putting this forum together. Um, I am Executive Vice President of Strategy and Planning for Amtrak. 
and um, been Amtrak for about six years. Um, spent a lot of time in my career in transportation. I was in the airline business for a long time and then did a sojourn in telecom for a few years before coming back to transportation. Um, and though I work at our headquarters in Washington, D.C., that's actually home away from home. I actually live in Colorado. So, um, so I've got my own personal vested interest in, uh, in seeing front page passenger rail come to fruition. Okay, thank you to all. And I, I do want to acknowledge also that the general manager of the Front Range Passenger Rail District is here with us, uh, Andy Karzian. Um, so he, yep. he, he, talk to Andy if you have detailed questions about, um, about Front Range Passenger Rail District. So I'm going to start by just uh, providing some background, some context for the, the discussion that we're going to have for, for folks who who have not been here in the Front Range with us for the last 20 years or so. So um, in, in 2004, um, the RTD Fast Tracks ballot issue was approved by the voters to provide funding for light rail, commuter rail, and bus rapid transit service uh, in the Denver region. Uh, but full re realization of this plan has stalled over the last 15 years. Building on fast tracks, Colorado has taken successive steps to advance passenger rail in our state. In 2009, the Division of Transit and Rail was created within CDOT. And in 2017, the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission formed to continue efforts to preserve and advance uh, Amtrak's Southwest Chief service in Colorado and to lead efforts to develop new inner city passenger rail service to serve the I-25 corridor. In the last few years, federal and state opportunities have breathed new life into the goal of substantial passenger rail expansion in Colorado. Uh, and in 2021, the Colorado legislature took a historic step, creating the Front Range Passenger Rail District, uh, and, uh, it, and it serves as the successor to the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. So the district is a new uh, local government. It is a special district, and it's the largest special district in Colorado. Uh, its boundaries span portions uh, or the entirety of the 13 counties that border I-25 from New Mexico to Wyoming. And um, the, the Front Range Passenger Rail District is responsible for designing, financing, constructing, operating, and maintaining a passenger rail system along the Front Range. Uh, the district uh, is going to be a powerful new tool to advance intercity rail, uh, as the district can raise the funding and provide the governance necessary to bring intercity rail to our state. Uh, the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is providing $1.2 trillion in federal funding opportunities to support transportation infrastructure improvements across the country, with $66 billion of those dollars having been identified for rail improvement projects alone. Governor Polis has made clear that transportation innovation, including the development of inner city front range passenger rail service, is a major priority in his second term. Although the route has not been finalized, if I can speak on behalf of the Northwest Metro region, um, through my role on the N uh, Northwest MCC, I would say that we in this region enthusiastically support the prospect of front range passenger rail and expanding inner city regional access. We're studying whether Amtrak should be the operator of this new regional passenger rail service, and we look forward to hearing more from our panelists about these potential partnerships and the opportunity Front Range Passenger Rail Service provides to potentially implement RTD's uh, Fast Tracks Northwest Rail Project. So with that rather lengthy background uh, in mind, um, I would like each of the panelists to take about five minutes to share your perspective on the partnerships and the contractual commitments that would be needed to bring Front Range Passenger Rail to fruition. And I think we'll just start, I love the way you're lined up here because I think that is the right way to go about addressing this. So if we could start, John, with you in about five minutes. Terrific, thank you, Claire, and thanks for the invitation and thanks for Commuting uh, Solutions for bringing me here today. Um, so 
you know, here's the exciting news. Uh, we're actually in Infrastructure Week. We've been talking about Infrastructure Week for, um, <laughs> seems like, decades. Um, and, you know, to uh, Representative Nagusa's point, we have a historic moment, historic opportunity through the bipartisan infrastructure law. But it's limited. It's a five-year bill. Um, it's not enough. And you've got some strong competition, as you've seen uh, from the presentation from Julie this morning. So in addition to, I think, the framing that he provided, which I think is excellent, about partnerships, um, uh, I'd add two other uh, words to the mix. One is performance, um, to compete with uh, the others for this money because it's going to be oversubscribed. You've really got to perform and you've got to really make a great case uh, to show why Colorado deserves this money and this project deserves uh, this money or projects uh, deserves this money. And then I would also add urgency. We're two years, almost two years into the five-year period of the bipartisan infrastructure law. A lot of that money's already gone out the door. Um, a lot of it will be awarded over the next few months. Uh, and so, you know, if Colorado wants a share of that, uh, you've got to work on that. So persistence, but urgency and performance, and I know there's a tension uh, between them. And one of the things that the Front Range Rail District, uh, the state, and all the partners need to work through is just how to balance, um, you know, not going too fast, but going fast enough. Um, and one of those places that I think is really important is Partnership, like marriage, means sometimes you have to have hard conversations and work through hard issues. And I think we're in that same place for project development here. So let me talk quickly about the opportunity. Um, as um, uh, Claire mo noted, um, there is $1.2 billion uh, in the infrastructure bill. There's $66 billion assigned for rail, and that's just for inner city rail. It doesn't include what FTA has. Um, you know, which is another significant chunk of money for community rail, light rail, uh, other sort of programs. Um, within that, $36 billion is assigned under the federal state partnership program. That's been the kind of premier tool for building inner city rail, um, and Congress assigned $36 billion of advanced appropriations. It also said there's a possibility of adding, adding additional money uh, in the normal uh, appropriation cycle. Um, what we're seeing, since we don't have a budget for this year, we don't have a budget for next year, uh, is that, um, that that's a target for some of the uh, uh, Republicans in the House of Representatives right now. Um, they've aimed at FTA's CIG program, which I know Deborah cares deeply about. Uh, they've aimed at the federal uh, state partnership. So I think for now, we probably have to assume uh, that that $36 billion is what's out there. From that 36 billion, 12 billion uh, has been assigned for national programs off of the Northeast Corridor, uh, basically the kind of key route between Boston and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, as you heard just with the flavor this morning, there are a lot of projects that are chasing after that money. So one of the things that Congress did in the bill um, and FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, is implementing is this new program corridor ID and really intending to create a pipeline for projects similar to the pipeline that's part of the capital investment program that FTA has run for years um, to really go from soup to nuts and help bring projects to the fore. Uh, so the capital ID program uh, was formally set up last year. Um, there was a, a notice soliciting requests for that. Colorado did apply with all the partners, Front Range Rail uh, District, good to see you, Dave. Um, along that project, um, you've got 90 competitors in that program right now. FRA is intending to make announcements on who made the cut in November. Um, and even within the folks who do make the cut, that's not a guarantee that you'll actually get to the actual construction funding and further advanced funding um, in the federal state program. But it's a critical opportunity Congress identified in the bill that if you are selected to be part of that quarter ID program, that that is a plus factor, a preference factor uh, in the award of those grants. And so it will be incredibly important both for the money, it will allow uh, an instant $500,000 to do basic scoping work, move on to a step two that only has a 10% local match uh, to do the service development plan, which I know has already started. 
um, and then a third stage with a 20% uh, match to do the kind of project development work that will be needed to really kind of ripen things up uh, to hopefully compete for some of that money. But we've got uh, three years, probably four NOFO cycles, uh, notice of funding opportunity cycles left uh, in that piece. And so, you know, the, the pressure is on. In terms of the question about contractual arrangements, um, a lot of that work uh, will go into applications to support um, both the corridor ID process, but also ultimately an application for that federal state program. It requires agreements with a potential operator. Um, that may be Amtrak. Uh, that requires agreements with the host railroads, probably two in the case of Front Range Rail, um, as well as the sort of partnerships, local match arrangements, financial arrangements. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of marital issues to be resolved um, in order to be able to make that claim. That will ultimately lead to grant agreements. Every step of the corridor ID program will have a contractual arrangement with the Federal Railroad Administration, um, as well as any construction grants that are provided on that front. Um, so with that, I'm happy to look forward to questions and discussion with the rest of the panel. Um, but I think, um, you know, going back to the persistence and urgency point, um, you know, I think um, you've got to master the details because you know Washington, DOT, Sound Transit, Texas, and others are doing that. But you've also got to have that compelling story backed up by numbers, backed up by solid data. Why do we deserve this money? And none of the 90 plus other uh, projects uh, out there actually. Some of them will get that money too. Um, but there's a real competition here. Um, and how do we justify for Congress that this uh, money should be renewed when that five-year period is up? Because we know uh, that the five-year bill is historic, but it isn't close to enough. Well, thank you, John, for that. Uh, I think you can tell immediately, and you probably already knew how lucky we were to have John in the DOT in the first place, and now to have him back here in Colorado with, with that knowledge that he brings to this. Um, so, David, could you um, bring your perspective from CDOT? Thank you, Commissioner. I think this group understands that partnerships are essential. No one entity can advance a mega project you might alone. You want to pull the microphone a little closer? Closer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's important to open up the tent and bring stakeholders and various perspectives in so that uh, everyone can help shape and deliver that vision. It's also important for each entity to bring their role and, and their strength and, and know that responsibility. And, and that's part of that marital conversations is, is kind of, Julie talked about bumping into each other in early stages, but I think getting a rhythm on these complex quarters is really essential. I'm the project manager for the service development plan, which I'll talk about later, but uh, I'm coming from a technical perspective and performance is something that I want to dig a little bit deeper in. Um, we know that uh, the Passenger rail doesn't start and end at the platform. Having other trips, having transit, having a high-functioning uh, multimodal system is really important. So it's RTD, but it's also Transport and, and Mountain Metro and Outrider and Bustang, all working in harmony so that all those systems can complement one another and, and get to a higher performance. Same with uh, scooters and bike and ped. So it's an integrated system. Um, I think about customers as partners, so looking at our academic institutions in, within the corridor. Um, we know that students are early adopters and are willing to change their behaviors to take a train, and so understanding their behaviors and, and implementing their uh, needs into our service options is really important, as is um, special events, tourism, recreational trips. Those are kind of some of the characteristics of a long-distance service. So all of those activities that are happening, whether it's um, our retired, our disabled population, our veterans, all uh, tourism folks who are coming here and, and using the train as part of the experience. Again, that fits into and defines our service options. And then finally, um, our business community, other chambers, other business improvement districts um, at the local level that will help. We're looking to target major markets, and so there's our high population and employment centers. And so that's a part of the partnership as well. Um, I'm, you know, for all the things that CDOT brings, whether it's engineers or modelers or biologists, there's limits on what CDOT can do. So we look to NGOs, we look to TMAs um, to help promote and market and um, advocate 
for this idea. And so that's gonna be an important partnership. And, and I say that not to pander, but I, um, I know the role that commuting solutions and the like have had in delivering important projects. Um, governance at the local level is really critical. Communities that do local planning looking to the future, we've talked about land use earlier this morning, but that demonstrates their readiness. Uh, Longmont and Boulder and communities along the corridor have done station area planning that does not, it shows that they're forward thinking. Um, at a regional level, um, COGS and MPOs can come together and say, maybe not consensus, but buy in on a vision, knowing that each of their individual communities are affected in different ways. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about FRA as a partner too. They're providing oversight. Um, we talked about the funding opportunity, but their guidance and their process has been really helpful. They have lessons learned on successful and unsuccessful corridors that have been considered lost across the country. And so we want to stand on their shoulders. Uh, as much as all of us think about trains and have needs and wants and perspectives, whether it's placemaking or branding or the menu on the dining car, I, they help us focus on what's first. And so that leads me to the contracts. Um, John talked about the operator, um, whether it's Amtrak or another entity, they're gonna have a business model on fares and pricing, labor, security, technology, and service that will they'll bring to the table. And so that's a negotiation as Colorado makes that choice. Similar fleet is also a compelling and exciting idea with emerging technologies and understanding their safety, their readiness on, on our facility, the railroad's um, willingness to take that fleet on their facility, and the availability of that is also a lot of things that go into the fleet conversation and contract. And I think most important is the railroads themselves. We're talking about a public benefit. The railroads have a bottom line and have shareholders. And so how do we have that relationship? Where is that win-win where passenger rail and additional trains on their tracks is a perceived burden? So that's a very uh, important conversation that Colorado has to be united and intentional about. Okay, thank you, David. So Deborah, if you could bring RTD's perspective. Yes, thank you so much. And I would agree with everything that John and David said as we talk about partnerships. So I'll just expound and provide some clarification further to the vantage point in which RTD brings, recognizing that we are a regional transit provider, but relative to fast tracks for all intents and purposes, relative to the comments that it was stalled for 15 years, I'd be remiss not to state that during the past 15 years, we were able to deliver on the A, B, G, and N lines, in addition to the Southeast Rail Extension, as well as the Flatiron Flyer. So while we have not realized the Northwest corridor relative to having rail, I think this is a great opportunity to engage and have a discussion about the importance of partnerships. And one thing that's happening right now is working in tandem with the jurisdiction, excuse me, with the local jurisdictions so we can develop a common set of facts and we're doing that through our Northwest Rail Feasibility Study and recognizing that there's different needs. RTD may not know all the needs, but you all know the needs because you're living and working in those communities. We do understand that public transportation um, and transportation as a whole, or mobility I should qualify it as, is an economic generator. And oftentimes when we look at the mobility options that David made mention of, we have to think of other conveyances, not just those that are large complex vehicles um, that require a lot of infrastructure. But with that, keeping in mind that one of the critical partners and one of the reasons it's been difficult to realize Northwest Rail is that RTD does not own the right of way. So picking up on what you said, BNSF is very critical. And where do I see linkages as we go forward? It's in the sense of understanding what it is that we don't know now, the operational costs, the designs. And there's synergy as we look at front range passenger rail because we don't know what we don't know until we get that common set of facts and recognizing that we did have an opportunity and it's critically important to RTD because we were able to sit down at the table with BNSF and I have to commend my staff. The only time we could get a meeting was on a holiday which was June 19th and staff made sure they were at the table and we recently have engaged in a contractual agreement where we can get information relative to what those operating costs 
are. And as we look at projections in reference to ridership and costs and things of the like, we're hoping we'll be in lockstep. And I meet regularly with the executive director of Front Range Passenger Rail because we both need that information. We don't know if the alignment will be along the Northwest Corridor at this point in time, but it will be optimal recognizing where the R and RTD and we provide commuter rail, it gives great synergy to the opportunity to bring forward inner city passenger rail. And we need to ensure that we have a, comp a comprehensive transportation network for the region because not everybody's gonna live close to a station um, they need other options in which to get there, and we have to be willing to lean in at the table and have those conversations quite naturally in order to ensure that we bring this to fruition. And so to the point that were raised, local communities, you know, um, relative to TMOs, businesses, academia, not to mention our obvious partners being um, federal government, i.e. be it FTA, be it FRA, and the individual sitting at this table in and of itself. We have to be open to having conversations. We also have to ensure that we're courageous with those conversations and be vulnerable when we have those conversations because we may get to a point where we're gonna have to make tough decisions and recognizing that we don't have to be disagreeable when we disagree, what's the end game that we're trying to achieve and that's to move people in this mega region and ensure that it's competitive. And with that being said, RTD is here for it as we talk about support letters, as we talk about having um, experts within our ranks with our talent, we're willing to provide support letters and testify has been evidence with recent trips in which we've uh, taken part. So with that, I will yield the floor to my colleague to my right to get Amtrak's perspective. Yeah, thank you. And Dennis, so just as uh, before Dennis speaks, so a reminder, so um, Amtrak, we have not selected the operator for this corridor. Uh, Amtrak brings a lot to the table on that. Um, and so we'll be looking at that much more in much more deal, detail down the road. But given your experience uh, in this area, Amtrak operating on freight rail corridors and in partnership with local transit, maybe you could, um, uh, could address the prompt. All right, well, yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, and, and to that point, right, we're, you know, there's, there's still a process to select an operator. Um, we obviously have got a lot of experience as being an intercity passenger operator, uh, and so can bring a lot of that, uh, that experience to bear. Um, but, you know, Amtrak is interested in seeing intercity passenger rail expand and succeed across America. So, you know, if somebody else is doing it, Okay, great. Let's let's see it work. Um, we'd love to be the ones to do it, but um, but nevertheless, um, we are we really want to see intercity passenger rail succeed. So, from all of the other panelists, you kind of have gotten a pretty good uh, cross section of of all the uh, the different stakeholders. I mean, it really does start with the communities that are going to be served. So um, many of the people in this room are are one of are represent partners that are very important. Uh, one of our one of the members of our board of directors is uh, former mayor of Macomb, Illinois, um, town that's served by one of our our state supported uh, services. And as he always reminds us, is you know, mayors and the local local communities are critically important to support for for the rail services that get provided. I mean, that's that's you know, the, the service, the Illini and, and Saluki, the the, the um, Carbondale service in in Illinois um, got started largely because there was a, a good amount of groundswell of support um, locally. To, to make sure that that could happen. And so that's, it really starts with the local communities as being partners. Um, and then, you know, you've, you've kind of heard the, the litany from there. Obviously we would, if we were the operator, whoever the operator is, would be working with the district and the state um, as uh, that's that, and I'll come back to that a little bit. That's, that's kind of one of the key contractual, um, when it gets to contracts, that's one of the, the key areas. Um, but the railroads um, that that the service would operate over is critical. Um, you know, we at Amtrak we have um, 
We own most of the Northeast Corridor, the railroad between Washington, D.C. and Boston. Not all of it, but most of it. Um, but outside of that, you know, almost 98% of our route miles are operated over somebody else's railroad. And, uh, and you know, David, David referenced that. Um, and, and then we have partners, you know, like, like RTD. You know, we've got commuter railroads um, in the Northeast to operate over our railroad. So, um, so we're kind of on the other side of that, uh, that equation there as well. So cooperation, um, getting a good agreement with the, the local entity, whether it be the state or a district that's going to support the service, um, and the railroads are key. There'll also be, um, in some cases, there might be um, contractual issues with owners of stations. As the service development plan proceeds and it's determined where the stops will be and what the stations are going to be, you know, some of those stations might be owned by some private entity today. And so there'll be some, some work that will have to be done to, uh, to figure out the access and, and how that's going to work. So, a lot of, of different players that are involved. You, you heard the reference to the FRA, um, the Corridor Identification and Development Program is, is a great program. You know, we at Amtrak had put out our vision of where we thought inner city passenger rail could be successful around the country. Front Range was one of the, uh, one of the routes that was on that vision. We're now sort of, you know, we like to think that that helped with uh, moving things along with the, the bipartisan infrastructure law and the, the program that now exists for development of corridors. But that really now is the, is the vehicle that, that um, the Federal Railroad Administration's corridor identification and development program is the vehicle to move forward. Um, and, uh, and we're all excited to see the announcements coming out here in a few months as to uh, which routes were selected. Um, and there'll be, as referenced, a series, as, as John mentioned, a series of agreements that then need to be uh, concluded with the FRA for the grants that will help provide the funding to be able to advance the, the corridor service. So a lot of different players, um, you know, we at Amtrak have got uh, a lot of experience in this area. We currently work with um, 17 states, 19 different um, entities within those states to support 28 state-supported routes across the country. So um, this is kind of something we do every day. Um, and, and we've got one of the key contracts is we've got an annual operating agreement with, with the state um, in, for, or, or the entity that's supporting the service um, to provide that service and that uh, um, that's one of the key uh, key elements that needs to be concluded to, to move the service forward once you get into operation. That's after all of the work on figuring out the capital and the infrastructure work that needs to be done to actually initiate the service. So lots of players, really exciting time, um, and we're looking to uh, whether we're the operator or not, looking forward to seeing success for Front Range Passenger Rail. Well, thanks, Dennis. And, and we're going to stay with you now for the yep. next question. What we're, we're going to have some individualized questions addressed to each panelist that really get into their uh, particular area uh, in more detail. So, um, so the, the question and the intro to the question are, um, so in Amtrak Connects Us, U.S. Corridor Vision, Amtrak describes expansion efforts that include adding the Cheyenne to Pueblo passenger rail service. The Front Range Passenger Rail District has applied for the FRA Corridor Identification Development Program, which we've heard about a little bit this morning. Uh, and assuming that we are accepted into that program and that Amtrak operates the service, what can the state of Colorado, the Northwest Metro Region, RTD and all of the other partners that have been mentioned here this morning do to advanced FRPR partnership with Amtrak? All right, thanks for that question, Claire. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be shamelessly steal um, from, uh, from Congressman Nagoose. Um, uh, it, it really is partnership and, and perseverance um, because it will, it will take a good bit of time 
to make things happen. So that's why the, the perseverance is important. Um, you know, obviously, as we heard, folks out here have been at this for a long time, uh, but it still is gonna take a few more years um, to, to actually complete the, the service development plan that uh, Front Range Passenger Rail District is working on right now. And then that identifies really the, the additional work and kind of the, you know, some of the capital improvements that will be necessary to make a competitive um, intercity passenger rail service. So now, then those improvements need to get made. Maybe not all of them, you know, might not have to be done before service could start, but there's, there's a, gonna be some phasing and, you know, probably some improvements. So it'll take a little bit of time. People need to stick with it. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I mentioned that we have 28 state-supported service routes across the country right now, so that's evidence that, hey, you can get there, <laughs> right? So um, it, it works, uh, you know, actually, we heard this morning um, from Julie from WashDOT, so Cascades service is, is a service that I think in many ways is very similar to the, um, the service that we'd see along the front range. So it's, it's kind of connecting up and down that, that I-5 corridor at the Amtrak provides the Cascades service between um, Oregon and um, up to Seattle and then up to Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, so so that, that perseverance is gonna be per important. But the key thing is also the partnership. Um, is, as you've heard everyone mention, there'll be a lot of work, a lot of agreements that need to get worked out, and having the local support to make sure that, um, that folks are continuing to communicate the message that, hey, we see the benefit and the value in having this service come to fruition uh, is gonna be important to make sure that all of the various stakeholders and players uh, are willing to stay at the table and engage and help us move forward. Because, um, you know, as we talked about, we're, you know, the, the service would be um, operating most likely when the, uh, you know, when the alignment is, is selected over um, freight railroads. Um, so need to be able to, to get that cooperation and their agreement to make that happen. And then in the end, um, you know, as much as you'd love to have uh, public transportation like intercity passenger rail be profitable and covered by the revenue that's get collected at the fare box, that's not really the way it works. So, you know, it, it requires a subsidy. Um, you know, one of the things that we work at from our standpoint is to try to continually get more efficient um, and economies of scale by expanding our services, one of the ways we can get more efficient. But nevertheless, the amount of revenue that's collected from the riders does not meet, does not match what it costs to operate the service. That's why we talk about all the other public benefits that are delivered by the service. Um, and so the way that state-supported service works, at least if it's work with Amtrak under um, the law of PREA 209, uh, is that the state or the other um, local entity, usually a state, um, but like in the instance of our Downeaster service in New England, it's provided by the Northern New England Passenger Rail Association as opposed to the state of Maine. Um, but anyway, that, that entity basically provides the subsidy, um, the difference, most of the difference um, between the costs to operate and the, um, and the revenue that's collected. So, the, the, basically the taxpayers need to be committed and, and decide, can stick with it, that yes, this is something we want to have and, um, and that's gonna be necessary and helpful to be able to, to get the service into operation. Okay, thank you, Dennis, for that. Um, we're gonna move to uh, John Putnam again. Uh, and uh, this is a multi-part question that's related to the IIJA legislation. You, you addressed a little bit of this in your opening comments, but um, could you please explain how funding through IIJA could advance rail expansion for Colorado? And as you respond to this question, um, keep in mind some additional questions about the level of competition across the country in accessing this support, which you've also alluded to, uh, how the state of Colorado should pos position itself to have the best chance of winning this funding. 
uh, and what advice you have for the Northwest region and our partners to successfully complete for this funding. And I think now that you're no longer at DOT, you might be able to answer a little more fully on that. Thanks. Uh, that's right. And I was mentioning, I think, uh, out in the lobby, um, one of the disadvantages of actually being at DOT is you have to be scrupulously neutral across the country for all Americans and uh, all the states, territories, districts. Um, and now I can be uh, shameless in my love of Colorado. Um, Please do. Uh, in the front range. So, um, you know, really, I think, hit some of the uh, key parts of the first part of the question. We'll mention that there are other pots of money. Uh, Congress allocated $8 billion for the uh, capital investment um, grants, um, portions for FTA, $7.5 million for RAISE, which State Highway 119 got. There are a number of different pots of money that are out there. Every one of them is oversubscribed, with one or two small exceptions that are not relevant uh, here. And so, you know, the competition is stiff um, and, you know, need to be able to formulate, um, you know, a very competitive application. And so persistence is important. 119 is informative. Um, it was a success, but it took more than one try. Um, you've got to, you know, mind your P's and Q's, look very closely at the notice of funding opportunity and make sure you're answering all the questions as quantitatively and qualitatively as possible. Um, you've got to take advantage of the opportunities to do debriefs if you don't win uh, the first time uh, and improve your application to address some of the questions that uh, in this case, uh, DOT Office Secretary had. In another case, it could be FRA or FTA or another entity. Um, you've got to do all that blocking and tackling. We've hammered partnerships enough. I won't say more about that, but it is absolutely essential. And as uh, Representative Nagu said, it was critical, I think, for um, uh, State Highway 119 to be able to show those interests. So getting to the kind of core part of the story, um, take a close look at the criteria for how FRA will um, award that money. And it really gets to questions of how is Amtrak going to operate better, move more people, move them more quickly, more reliably, more safely. Um, how, what's our uh, ridership? How many trains? Um, what are the land use effects? Um, quantify what it means for pollutant emissions. I'm glad we had the question about equity. How are we serving disadvantaged communities? Um, you know, in the federal government, we talk about our Justice 40 program, uh, which is really an intent to provide 40% of the benefit of our spending uh, to disadvantaged communities. How are we gonna do that? It's gonna take numbers, it's gonna take data. So I was glad uh, to hear from uh, David and Deborah about the critical importance of data that uh, we're pulling together that service development plan here in Colorado we're pulling together a lot of that data because that's what's gonna be the differentiator um, between different programs and have seen a number of um, you know, really cool looking projects not make it to the finish line because they weren't able to actually back up. We are going to improve sustainability. We are going to improve equity. We are gonna improve mobility, but not actually have the kind of numbers and you know, real hard support behind that. That's the task um, that's in front of us right now and so, you know, I think it's important to lean into this moment um, to come together to make sure that we are using the states, the districts, both districts, um, all of the communities rep represented around here to get that information, to tell the land use story, um, to make sure that we're reflecting in that, to capture all of that benefit, um, to be able to come up with the most compelling uh, application that will stand up with Texas or Massachusetts or uh, Oregon uh, and uh, Seattle, knowing that one of the challenges we have is that some of this district is going through um, rural areas, not as many people to put on trains, and we have to tell that story. At the same time, providing service to those rural communities is part of the benefit that we're providing, and so make sure that we're really reflecting um, you know, the benefits uh, of the potential service and tying it into RTD or Metro or some of the other, uh, or our uh, CDOT's uh, transit-based services to really provide that network benefit, which I think is got the leveraging advantage that Colorado has. Thank you very much uh, for that answer. That's really helpful. 
Um, and I, I think the, the level of competition is kind of daunting, but, I don't, but we've never shrunk from that. So I think the challenge has been laid. Um, so we'll move on to Deborah Johnson. Um, and um, the question I have for you is, based on your extensive transportation experience, which you outlined in your introduction, can you please share how, uh, one, the feasibility study regarding Northwest Rail peak service might align with the planning efforts for Front Range Passenger Rail, and secondly, how those two undertakings might be combined into a cohesive joint effort from your perspective? And additionally, uh, as you're answering that question, could you share your thoughts on different governing and operational structures of which you may be familiar, uh, which could potentially be modeled to implement a jointly operated service along the Northwest Corridor? Thank you, Claire. That was a lot, but yeah. we got it. And yeah. I think John teed this up for me perfectly as we talk about data. I am one that believes that you can't manage what you can't measure. And so as we try to manage this process, we have to ensure that we have data. And so as I shared in my previous response, what's critically important is for RTD in its place in this here in time to work in tandem with BNSF because right now we have no understanding about the operational cost since we do not own the right of way. That's critically important as we discern what might headways be because right now we're looking at peak service because of the limitations without us owning um, the railroad. And then as I talk about Front Range Passenger Rail, the service development plan that is underway with that entity is critically important. And I do want to qualify that I do sit on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board as an ex-officio member because that is quite important. I'm going to intertwine the other response really quickly because recognizing in other parts of the country, you can have people that are sitting on uh, in DC, for instance, when we talk about the Virginia Railway Express, you have somebody from the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, um, the two primary members that sit on the WMATA, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, which you may know as Metro, but since I work there as WMATA to me, then they sit on that board. And then additionally, they are members of the Virginia Transportation Association Board. So there's that connectivity, so the right hand knows what the left hand is doing when you're trying to talk about a comprehensive of transportation network. So pivoting back to the opportunities with the Northwest Rail Feasibility Study, which we're looking at peak service and in relationship to the Front Range Passenger Rail, I think the commonality is BNSF. That's critically important because right now we don't know what we don't know. So sharing that information, being at the table talking about what might be optimal because it's purely conjecturing and speculation at this point, not knowing who the operator will be, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, but recognizing that the general manager of Front Range Passenger Rail and myself have to stay in constant communication. I have to be attentive when I say I, I as the representative of the RTD. Um, engage in those meetings as an ex officio member to understand where we might go relative to the timeline. Uh, Mr. Carson and I have talked about where we are with BNSF since we just were able to leverage that contractual agreement. So as it comes to this data set, we won't have that readily available now until May, recognizing, you know, it took some time. It's like equivalent to a herd of turtles running through peanut butter when you're dealing with BNSF. Not throwing the show, I'm not trying to throw shade, but I'm just stating the obvious facts. And so as we look at this, I want to, I'm saying that publicly for the simple fact we're not playing you know, fast and loose. We want to ensure that there is an understanding as we go forward, and that's why it's so imperative that we're working in tandem with the jurisdictions along the Northwest Rail Corridor so individuals know what's happening, staff that is, and in turn briefing you know, elected officials as well. I think that is critically important. So recognizing that BNSF in tandem with us are in the process of determining those needs and that actually just kicked off you know, a few weeks ago, assuming that the preferred alternative is along the BNSF um, alignment, that's where we can really move things forward. But we have to keep in mind that the regional transportation district is limited. We are the RNRTD, which is regional. And so as we talk about inner city passenger rail, that's where there could be an opportunity 
to bridge something greater, recognizing the cohesive partnerships that are paramount, whether we talk about heavy rail, light rail, um, commuter rail, inner city passenger rail, funiculars, cable cars, there's so many different rail options and oftentimes people conflate, but recognizing we have to be able to lean into the point that John raised and have these conversations. Um, rounding out the question, the second part of it, my experience of uh, different governance or operating structures um, have been privy to be in organizations where my resident agency were part of uh, such entities. I do want to preface my statements by saying it's not a cookie cutter approach. There is not a plug and play. Collectively, we need to determine what's best for this region, recognizing, like John said, when we talk about equity and we're talking about low-income populations, sure, there are rural areas and in the interest of full disclosure, I haven't basically been in an area where we were providing um, any rail service to rural areas. So recognizing that we can engage and qualify what that may be. So one in particular that um, I'll bring up and um, it's Caltrain. And Caltrain basically is along the peninsula in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that is a joint powers board. And um, the service in which Caltrain provides along the peninsula is a San Francisco to San Jose to Gilroy. Um, and that's critically important because you have the Silicon Valley. You have people that are trying to get in what I would refer to being from California as the city being San Francisco. But recognizing that there's so many viable options there because there is the connectivity. So in Santa Clara County where Gilroy and um, San Jose um, are located, there is the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, and VTA provides connectivity um, to a myriad of different stations, and they have shared stations. But recognizing that a member of Santa Clara County also sits on the Joint Powers Board representing those interests. Um, as it relates to San Francisco, that structure is done a little differently because my former agency being the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency that really is responsible for all surface transportation within the city and county, not only the world famous cable cars, but we're talking about um, sustainable streets as we qualified in the city. They're also the taxi regulator. So it's everything outside of maritime and aviation in the city and county of San Francisco. So the mayor appoints the representative to that joint powers board. And then as we look at um, um, San Mateo County, I excluded San Mateo County. Um, San Mateo County has their own transit district and at one point in time, just up to the latter part of November of 2022, Sam Trans had the um, responsibility of overseeing the operations. Just in November, that was bifurcated. So for all intents and purposes, it was the general manager and CEO that saw, oversaw Sam Trans, which is the uh, transit provider within San Mateo County, but also had auspices over Caltrain. The reason that came to fruition is because when the Joint Powers Board was first created back in 1985, Sam Trans or San Mateo County brought more money to the table and it was easier in that regard. So now, fast forward you know, to 2022, that has been bifurcated. There is a, an ex, uh, a separate executive director of Caltrain that oversees the day-to-day -day operations and that service is contracted out to a third party, which is Herzog. So that's one such, yeah. it's a lot. And then my second example really quickly is VRE, Virginia Rail, Rail Railway Express, which is in Northern Virginia and provides services um, into Union Station in Washington, D.C., and there's two lines, and that is a complicated structure in the sense there's so many different outlying counties and the representation in which they have, but VRE's body serves as a operational board, so they're overseeing the operations, whereas the counties that comprise VRE, and you may know a little bit more about this as well, recognizing that they too are operating on a myriad of different rail uh, rights away as it relates to rail, some owned by Amtrak, some owned by CXS, and some by um, Norfolk, Norfolk, Norfolk Southern. Southern, exactly. And so there's three different railroad lines. So that's a lot, I'm gonna yield the floor um, because my colleague could probably add different information, but thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you for that very comprehensive response. So 
Um, so um, the last question is for David Singer. Um, and as we've already heard, CDOT is managing the service development plan uh, for the future uh, Front Range Passenger Rail Service. Uh, so David, uh, can you tell us about the work that is being completed in the SDP uh, and how this lays the foundation for Colorado to successfully secure federal IIJA funding? And additionally, can you tell us about the current state rail plan update and the importance of the state rail plan to advancing passenger rail throughout Colorado? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to invert that and talk about the rail plan first. Sure. It's broader in scale for the entire state and it's a little bit more um, imminent. Sure. Um, CDOT is updating this passengers and freight rail plan. There are five goals. Ensure Colorado's rail system is safe and secure. Expand and improve the rail system for passengers and freight. Provide greater mobility and connection options. Preserve and maintain critical corridors and advance the state's economic vitality and environmental quality. So while trends may change since the last update in 2018, these goals are mature and broad. And so the plan really looks to expand how partners can work together to better move goods and people throughout the state on the rail network. The rail networks or the rail plans a little bit different than some other of our statewide plans. It's unconstrained. Um, it's, it's not grounded in, in um, money or, or price or, or cost benefit, but it allows us to be bold and ambitious and inclusive. Um, at the same time, it's finite and it's grounded. There are only so many rail corridors throughout the state, and uh, each of them have distinct opportunities for both freight and for passenger rail, not just on the, along the front range. So in practice, the update will do a couple of things. It identifies the stakeholders, the partners, who are the districts and the authorities, um, what are the funding and financing authorities and mechanisms in place for freight and passenger rail. It tells the story of uh, rails in Colorado, uh, what are the past initiatives, whether it's fast tracks, whether it's the mountain corridors advanced guideway system, saving the Southwest Chief in Southern Colorado. Uh, it also identifies trends, taking publicly available information on passenger so the performance of the Chief or the, or the Winter Park Express. It also looks at trends like coal throughout, and, and we can make some projections on, on how freight movement might be different and evolving throughout Colorado. It names the existing systems like the California Zephyr, the Southwest Chief, the Winter Park Express, RTD, but it also talks about scenic and historic railroads as too. Georgetown Loop is also in the, in the plan. And then it begins, as we engage all of those entities, we start to understand their visions. And we incorporate um, their current state, but where they want to be in the next five years and what, in the long term. And so it's capturing those ideas and then, in possible, identify some projects. Um, so for example, the last plan, the Southwest Chief had a mature from, uh, vision and data to support modernization. And over the past five years, the Chief was successful in bringing over $100 million in and, and grants to modernize that system. So, the Front Range Passenger Rail was a cornerstone of that last plan in 2018. And it is again in this plan too. It's a snapshot in time. Um, we know that the plan will be updated in time. We know that the Front Range will evolve in time, but it's a marker to all of our stakeholders and to federal partners that it's a priority for Colorado. So I wanted to talk about the plan first and its ambition um, as we segue into the project itself. Um, Julie talked, you could see her glow when she started talking about complex projects. And for 20 years in, at CDOT, I had the privilege to work on complex projects too, whether it's the 36, there's a lot of teammates here. And that's something that is um, a legacy. It's something that's tangible and I've gravitated to. The state collectively has never really shied away from innovative complex projects. And so when Colorado received a federal grant to do corridor planning, which is service development plan, um, we raised our hand and leaned into that opportunity. It was before the IIJA. Um, FRA was being optimistic and, and recognizing that they needed a pilot. They needed a proof of concept and a model to serve for the rest of the country. Um, and so we worked with them to develop a scope and a process to, that worked for us, but also could be duplicated across the country. So in spite of the urgency and stiff competition, we've got about a year or two head start on all the other corridors that are looking to introduce new service. So that is good. There are going to be some growing pains as we 
understand some best practices and lessons learned. But from Colorado, we brought all the innovations that we have working with FTA and FHWA on accelerating projects and um, whether it's planning environmental linkages, all the ways we can streamline this concept while engaging the public, getting federal buy-in, including planning decisions at the local and regional level. FRA incorporated their best practices and lessons learned, um, whether it's with railroads or operators. We mentioned the criteria. Um, we're going to adopt those criteria for successful corridors at every step of our process. Equity inclusivity, legislative intent in project planning, regional equity, performance, ridership and travel time, environmental context, connection, connections with other modes, input from the railroads and the operators. So it, it's, it's a balancing act. Those are a lot of factors and it may not, you know, there'll be trade-offs with any of these complex projects. So um, what's in the service development plan? All planning studies start with what are our goals, what are our objectives, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, if you can grab a flyer, we laid out a, a one-pager. We talk about providing choice for transportation. We talk about connecting communities. We talk about economic vitality and doing so in an environmentally sustainable way. Those are broad goals, so let me, we have a little bit more definition on how we're going about doing that. It's a modest introduction of service. It's operating on existing tracks from Pueblo to Fort Collins. It's a proof of concept. And we're looking to capture early adopters who, what customers and what markets are ready to be a part of this today. And what we've seen is that that works across the country. You start with a successful proof of concept and it evolves in time. So um, we've talked about route. That's one of the early steps. Part of our alternatives analysis is also service. What type of trip and what type of customer are we looking to provide? How many trips a day? What, how many stops? What time of day? Is that weekend or weekday trips? You can see different variables and range of service options that we'll be developing to provide the necessary data. More service, more trains, more trips may require more infrastructure to provide the type of service that we want. And so the investment, the infrastructure we need will also be a range of options. And that could be more tracks, it could be more bridges, it may be tunnels, platforms. What is the tangible things needed to make the facility out there today provide the necessary service for freight, but also for passengers? And so you start to have the characteristics of a range of alternatives. Data will help us defend and understand and test out these different scenarios. So we'll do a ridership model using the statewide model that Dr. Cog originally built. So we'll begin to understand the projections for each of these scenarios. We'll understand speed, we'll understand the concept working closely with the railroads on how it affects their operations. We'll understand the revenues that may come from such riders. And then we'll understand um, the availability and accessibility of the certain stations and markets along the corridor too. Um, this is where we can, don't have to start from scratch. Amtrak has a station area guidance that is um, broad and helpful for us, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. These principles, um, whether it's a small, medium, or large system, helps us pick the spot and also design what are the necessary amenities in order for that spot to function. Um, environmental cost, uh, environmental context, all of these things help us provide cost estimates not just to build it, but just to operate and maintain it on an annual basis. Um, so that helps us demonstrate what's operationally feasible. And then we begin to do a cost-benefit analysis using this data in place. And only then we'll start to understand how much it's gonna cost to pay and how are we gonna pay for it. And so that's where the financial questions begin to um, be answered based on the technical information. Uh, there was a reference to implementation. Ideally, we can do this all at once. But as we've seen as major projects, it's usually having it done in phases. And so this data will help. Am I being naive by saying this is a project manager, the data will drive phasing? Uh, I, the data will help drive how this is implemented, um, at least give informed information to, to decision makers. So that FRA is looking for a pipeline of projects for which to fund. And so that's kind of the high-level cookbook recipe for service development planning. Yeah, thank you, David. And, and what I wanted to say after that is, 
you know, when we get all of that, we will go to the voters and the voters will resoundingly say, yes, we want this and we'll be on our way. Um, thank you all for, for uh, what you've brought to this discussion this morning. It's, it's been really rich and valuable. Um, okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to know, yeah. So we do have about five minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, who would like to go first? And lack of do I? Oh, I'm Tara. Yeah, there you are down there. Yeah, Tara, go ahead. So Please, I, um, I appreciate, if yeah, I may, Commissioner, yeah. and I making an assumption that's directed at me, and trust and believe it's nothing personal, it's strictly business, because I understand the question. And so I've been very forthright and um, transparent about my responses. I could Monday morning quarterback this all day. I wasn't here when the initiative was placed on the ballot, but I own it now, and I am trying to uh, make a tasty pitcher of lemonade with a salty... <laughs> a big bag of salt and some moldy lemons. And so with that being said, recognizing that there was a ballot that was, there was, a, there was an initiative that was placed on the ballot. And from my understanding and my research that I've done, it wasn't carved out specifically, it was for fast tracks as a whole. And recognizing that when there were ridership projections, that as we talk about the competitiveness of projects, the first question I asked when I came into this region is why didn't we have a full funding grant agreement? And that's something we would have had in conjunction with the Federal Transit Administration because we didn't have those projects there. And so as we look at fast tracks as a complete package, there were different phases of said project. And when I came into this organization nearly three years ago, and I was getting questions such as the one you posed, council member, it was like, first and foremost, let's get a common set of facts because we're going off some data that could be stale. There's been changes. I look at things holistically. We'd be remiss to plan transportation and not look at it as a three-legged stool because there's land use, there's economic development, land use and housing, and then there's public transport. So as you ask the question to me, um, when will we get rail? We do know projected out relative to where we are with front and range passenger rail, and that looks to be more or less in the late 2040s, early 2050, and that's why we're working in tandem doing the study to discern what the path forward is. So uh, I don't know if, did you want to say something else? Because I saw you say something. Well, the point of the matter is we're talking about rail and as, you know, I would love to talk to you in more detail because I'll stand up and say oftentimes people look at a rail consist as the end-all be-all. There's other forms of mobility that can lead to economic development and vitality in a community. And while rail sets or train sets are exciting for people, there's other means of mobility that can be leveraged. And so considering that holistically, there's a multitude of things that can happen. That's why we're doing the Northwest Rail Feasibility Study to discern what that may be. We're also working, as I said in my previous comments, with BNSF, because basically where is the right of way gonna come from if we're not working with them recognizing what was stated nearly 20 years ago relative to this corridor and what needs to happen? 
So probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but I'm a straight shooter and that's where we are. And I wanted to say that for everybody as we look to where we are as a region, that's why it's imperative that we have conversations. It's imperative that we're partnering with different municipalities, federal state partners, so we can discern what might be the most viable path forward. So thank, thank you, you for Deborah. the question. Yeah, no, thank you for, for that uh, answer. And, and uh, Council Member Winder, thank you for the question, because mm -hmm. I think uh, that question reflects the big challenge we will have in this area mm -hmm. in asking the voters for additional money. And, um, and if I, I know as a moderator, I'm actually not supposed to have a thought about anything. <laughs> I'm just supposed to read what was written down here for me. But, um, but truly, I mean, I think the reason I am on this board uh, is because I see a partnership with Front Range Passenger Rail as really the, the best opportunity we are going to have just understanding the realities of the cost of putting commuter rail on a freight rail line. And so the partnership between RTD and FRPR um, is really the best opportunity we have to bring rail to this area. And, and we have a good partnership, and, I, and that's what's so good about having Deborah Johnson on the board uh, ex officio with us. So I think we're out of time. Um, thank you for that question. Thank you again to our panelists um, for the very valuable discussion. It was good to see you. Thank you so much to Commissioner Levy for doing an excellent job moderating the panel. And thanks to all of our panelists as they're exiting the stage um, for providing such insightful comments. We're, our hope today is that you walk away from this summit with a much deeper understanding of the intricacies of large-scale rail development in Colorado. And I think that's something the panelists did a great job in talking about. Um, and I would say to the last question, again, as an MC, I'm not supposed to probably offer my opinion. But I think transit-focused land use planning is good planning, and it's smart planning. So I think it's never a mistake to um, be planning for transit villages, um, transit-ready development, and transit-oriented development. So hopefully Boulder will continue and, and other communities in this region. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Evan Manville, climate mitigation planner with the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Program at the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. In addition to his work with Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Program, Evan also works with Oregon's Transportation and Growth Management Program, which is a joint effort of the state's transportation and land use agencies. In both roles, Evan works with communities to promote transportation and housing choices using communications, policy making, and planning tools. We're really happy that Evan's able to join us in Colorado today. Um, and to share his expertise on improving how cities can grow more sustainably. So please, joining me in welcoming Evan to the stage. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, get that up. Wonderful. Uh, well, it's wonderful to, to be back in Colorado. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Colorado and have spent my adult life uh, explaining to people across the country how the lambkins are a ferocious mascot. Go for cons high. Um, baby lambs. Um, anyway, uh, it's great to be here. So I, I'm here uh, to tell you a little bit about Oregon's approach to land use, transportation, and housing challenges. Um, I originally titled this Step 5 of 12, saying, oh, we've made a lot of progress, and then I was like, what? Well, these challenges are really big. So it's now Step 5 of 12,000. We've made some progress, but uh, hundreds of years of work to, uh, ahead of us. Now, Oregon and Colorado have a lot of similarities. Uh, both our history and our politics, um, our general size and our population, uh, some of our biggest challenges, um, and in fact, if you like lay out the state of Oregon, it pretty much fits on, or lay out the state of Colorado, it pretty much fits on Oregon. It's like somebody took Colorado, had a couple of good uh, Oregon or Colorado beers, and then drew Oregon. Uh, a little bit shakier, but, but we got a lot of similarities. So I think we have a lot to learn from each other. 
Now, Oregon's land use system uh, is generally talked about as starting in 1973, uh, bipartisan effort of a farmer, Republican farmer, uh, urban Democrat, and Republican Governor Tom McCall. Uh, and they said, hey, you know, we have some statewide values that we really want to protect everywhere. And deferring just to local governments is not enough, and it's not getting us to those goals. And so they set up a department that I work for and a commission to oversee us. And while the legislature continues to pass laws, uh, our commission has the ability to pass administrative rules, which have the force of law. Um, and the local plans that are now adopted follow both the statutory and the administrative rules. So localities have their own comprehensive plans, but they're within the greater system and they're conforming with that system. Now, some of the things similar to what Julie mentioned, um, uh, they, they copied a lot of our work, I would say. Um, we have urban growth boundaries around all our cities. They do, they're not set in stone. They can expand outwards gradually um, and with a lot of planning, but they do create efficient planning. Uh, also in these comprehensive plans are uh, steps to protect farmland and forest land, uh, things that the rural areas need, as well as the things that urban areas need, utilities, economic development, housing, transportation. As was mentioned in my introduction, and there's a flyer in your handout, um, I've worked with the Transportation Growth Management Program. In the early 90s, we realized that too often land use and transportation decisions were divorced from each other and not nicely uh, coordinated. And so we, Governor then Kitsauer said, hey, you all work, ODOT, our Department of Transportation, and the Land Use Planning Agency form our program together, and we said, great, and we pitched it to Federal Highways, and they said, yes, you can use some Federal Highways dollars uh, to help communities on projects that have that overlap. So uh, we've been funding hundreds of, of plans and efforts at local government levels to do a transportation plan, do a transit plan, do a downtown area plan, uh, diversify their housing, uh, think about parking, think about walkability, bring speakers. It's a really a variety of things that we've done both on the plans and, and in forwarding the community conversation. Every now and again, there's a site that's really key to a city and they're like, we wanna redevelop this site. We bring in a consultant or staff and say, this is the way it's best gonna serve your land use and your transportation needs. So that's been fabulous. It also hasn't gotten us where we've needed to go. So uh, Oregon uh, has pretty uh, standard science-based goals for reducing climate pollution and like most of the rest of the world, we're failing to meet them. And it's pretty dramatic, particularly in transportation pollution. We've made more progress in some of our energy cleanup and, and other things, but transportation, our largest sector of pollution, has been sticky. So uh, Governor Brown said, you need to fix this. Um, so we're cleaning up our fuels, we're cleaning up our vehicles, and our agency is like, we also need to drive less, and that's gonna have a lot of co-benefits if we do that. So, uh, we launched something clim called the Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Program. Um, images here are just kind of images of our extreme weather, how thousands of Oregonians are, have lost their homes, scores have lost their lives already under climate disruption. So very serious challenge um, and we need to course correct. Now the other thrust of the program uh, is equity. Land use and transportation have a pretty uh, embarrassing, uh, is not a strong enough word, horrific uh, legacy on, on uh, equity. We've located highways um, in certain places. We've, once we, redlining was declared illegal, we used single family zoning in its place to concentrate privileges uh, to the white and the powerful at the expense of communities of color and those with lower income. And that's had intergenerational effects because most wealth is transferred through property. So those people who benefited from redline, redlining or old zoning decisions have passed that on to their kids and so on and so on. And that's a large part why the average white household today has 10 times the, the wealth as the average black household. So we, we recognize that challenge and we're trying to see what we can do about it. So the program, uh, again, there's a one pager in, in your program, which is great has a lot of components. One is uh, regional scenario planning, and this is kind of complex computer modeling where we say, hey, let's twist a lot of dials in what you're doing locally and see how we can reduce climate pollution in your area. 
like through your local actions. A lot of it has to be federal or state or whatever, but what local actions can you take? So hey, let's increase the price of parking or let's dramatically increase transit service or let's uh, change your land use zoning so you allow more dense development. And uh, so this program requires the three largest metro areas to do that. Portland has already done it. They did it um, about 10 years ago. So they found a mix of actions that they could take to reduce their, their climate pollution. Now it's Salem-Kaiser and Eugene Springfield. So we're just launching that program over the next couple of years. Um, we should have some local plans that, that meet the model's goals. Um, smaller communities, given the intensity of that process, we decided let's just do some things that we know work. Uh, don't need to get too, too far in the detail. And the first is obviously allowing climate-friendly development happen where it, the market wants it to happen. Too often our land use plans have height restrictions or density restrictions or like all sorts of barriers to housing happening that's walkable or mixed use, mixed use development that's happening. So we're requiring 15 communities um, through our rules to identify specific climate friendly area zones and decide them that in theory a third of the community could live in them. So, uh, you know, it's, for some communities, that's a big twist. For some, it's a small tweak. For some, it's, hey, it's kind of in the middle. So we're kind of working with communities to get that done. Another part of the program is parking reform and management. Now, parking, parking mandates are the government pretty much encouraging more driving. It, it's the foot on the gas pedal during the climate crisis instead of the foot on the brake. Um, so abundant free parking means people drive more. Um, and it has all sorts of problems. You can see in the red here, this is a typical downtown. This is downtown Corvallis. I could do this for pretty much any downtown. That's all the parking. That's all the off-street parking. There's also on-street parking. That pushes uses apart, and it makes things less pleasant to walk. Um, it also has a huge impact on housing costs, uh, particularly multifamily housing. It's about 15, to, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the cost is parking. You're, we're, how, we're paying to house cars instead of house people. And it has impacts on small business redevelopment on all those things. So we thought, let's pass the nation's strongest parking reforms. We have this opening. Let's get it done. And this is what we did. We said, OK, no, we're not going to allow local governments to mandate parking near transit. Uh, we're not going to allow mandates for affordable housing or for child care or for um, small unit development, et cetera, et cetera, various equity uses. Um, we're going to limit how much parking has to be can be mandated for multifamily. And then cities have to go beyond that and do some more reforms. That doesn't mean parking's not going to get built. The market's pretty clear that a lot of people need a place to store their car, and they're going to provide it. And the lenders are going to stubbornly be risk adverse and like try to copy the past car-dependent developments. But you know, we at least need to get out of the way to allow it to happen where it can happen. The other thing we did, uh, those are kind of the land use reforms in the program. We did transportation reforms, and we said local transportation plans have to go further on planning for walking, biking, transit. Um, and they need to think about where they're investing uh, their transportation projects. And so let's do it in those walkable areas. Let's do it in underserved uh, areas with high concentrations of underserved populations, et cetera. And we need to move. Uh, beyond transportation planning mainly being about how do we quickly move cars everywhere. And so we're kind of asking local communities, hey, choose some local goals beyond V over C, like stopping congestion, um, and build a list of projects, because whatever's in the plan doesn't particularly matter, but like what, what's actually going to be built, model that, and together those projects cannot increase climate pollution. So you, we can't be going the wrong way. We clearly need, we need to go that way really fast, but let's not go that way in the, uh, in the, in the time being. So, and we also ask uh, local governments, say, hey, when you're expanding roads into big strodes or bigger roads, look at alternatives that might meet those goals um, in a more affordable way that better meets our goals. Now, most of this is long-range planning, so it's going to take years to know how that went, because this program started in 2020 and was adopted in 2022. Parking reforms uh, were front-loaded, because that's a policy change, and those have, those have happened. And nine Oregon cities 
have said, well, you gave us chance, you gave us you know, no choice, we're just gonna repeal all our parking mandates. So most Oregon's large cities have no parking mandates anymore. Um, and more are coming. And we've already seen developments that were shelved or denied come back to the permit counter and say, hey, I have this 100 unit affordable housing complex you told me several times, no, I'm, I'm bringing it back now, you can't deny me. Or, hey, this arcade owner was like, hey, I want to expand my arcade and serve beer and like, oh, you have to provide a lot of parking so people can drive drunk. It's like, okay, he no longer has to do that. <laughs> um, so the Sightline Institute has done a really nice job in picking up some of these anecdotes and these stories. I, I highly recommend uh, visiting their website if you're curious how transformational parking reform can be. It hasn't all been shiny. Uh, clearly, we sh we've taken on the status quo, and the status quo that, like the previous status quo, wasn't thrilled, or some people weren't thrilled. Um, so there were a couple of legal challenges from home builders and realtors, and also uh, about a quarter of the cities that this applies to. Um, so yeah, it, it's a hot topic. Um, they also introduced legislation to repeal what we did. Uh, and so we worked with local partners and had heated conversations and adjusted a few of the rules and some deadlines, uh, tried to find some resources, et cetera. The legislature did not pass that bill. Uh, they realized we're working in good faith with folks. And they actually provided $3 million for us to uh, help local governments implement it. So that was great. Uh, so we're going to continue to adjust it moving forward, but we wanted to be pretty aggressive um, and see what we could get done. So that's that program. Housing work, um, we have done a lot of housing reform, uh, and a lot of what, is, what was in Polis's bill it's, you know, copies a lot of what other states have done, including Oregon. So we allow granny flats everywhere, pretty much, um, and traditional starter housing, triplexes, duplexes. Uh, local governments can't stop that from happening. They have to allow it. Local governments also have to have housing production strategies because we're not producing enough housing. Uh, the state also said, hey, we need a bunch more affordable housing. Here's $2 billion. You know, that goes far, but not nearly far enough. Um, and then the state is just continuing to increase, hey, local governments haven't managed to get this done. So we need to increase the state authority um, again and again. Uh, and one of the things that they set up was a housing, so the state is now analyzing how much housing is needed. Let's break it down by community. Okay, you need to do your share, your share, your share, and adopt a housing production strategy uh, to get it done. So overall, this is kind of the tension, right? Um, the state is really trying to be, in some ways, a good, like, it's trying to be a good partner, but it's also trying to get to our shared goals. So we're out there, we're doing some analysis, we're providing resources, we're providing consultants, um, we're measuring how fast people are getting, uh, and we're really trying to make sure this happens. And the local governments are, are being good partners generally, um, making sure there's enough land, uh, updating codes on parking in climate-friendly areas, um, allowing their zones to have this kind of traditional uh, starter home, and they're being told to make progress on fair, fair and equitable housing and take some other actions. So how this plays out over the next few years, I don't really know yet. Like the accountability tools is, we have a lot of legal tools already. Like we can tell the federal government they're not complying with state law and then there are no federal transportation dollars. Or we could, you know, take over uh, their development review process and say, all right, we're going to process developments that come in. We have that power, but we don't have that politics necessarily to support that. And that's fair. Like, that's good. Like, so, so there are legal tools, and then there's the, the political reality and the political balance. So uh, this is a start. Uh, we've also changed where uh, that appeals of developments that were denied now have to provide, local governments provide attorney's fees if they're the appeal is successful. So there, there are lots of things that we're twisting and turning to make sure that the housing crisis is dealt with. And that's providing some consternation. Some conservation communities are upset about some of the things that are happening in Oregon, about expanding uh, urban growth boundaries, about doing, waiving some other laws that are put in there, all of which have good intent, 
but collectively it, it prevented us from meeting our housing goals. And Oregon has a housing crisis. We are 36,000 units short every year. Um, parking reform can do a big part of that, but like 10% of it. <laughs> so, you know, yes, thousands more, but we need tens of thousands more, and over a decade, hundreds of thousands more. So it's, it's been an interesting, strategy, interesting challenge. I would note two things and then open it to questions. One is pretty much all of this has happened in a bipartisan way. Um, the original land use program was passed by a Republican governor and with Republican legislators. Um, the, what people call missing middle, the duplexes, triplexes, that stuff, that wouldn't have passed without bipartisan support. There weren't enough um, Democrats to, to vote for it. It needed bipartisan support and got it um, substantially. Uh, a more aggressive housing uh, policy that failed by one vote would have shown up if four people didn't if four people had shown up to work, <laughs> four people skipped work, and that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> there, you know, but it did not have enough Democrat support. So really, I would recommend um, building the bipartisan coalitions, hearing the various tensions. There are various people who want to change different things in housing production and in land use. Um, and if we work together across party lines and coalitions, um, I think we're more likely to get to those shared goals that we all have under Oregon system and uh, goals that I think most, most states and most Americans have. With that, um, there are handouts in your thing. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I think it's more Colson, me kind of peripheral. With your housing discussion, I was wondering if you had any discussion related to the recent rapid rise of institutional investors in ownership of commercial properties? Uh, that's certainly been part of the conversation, but it hasn't been a huge driver of it. Um, people bring that up, and it's like, yeah, that's a s most of the conversations I've heard have said that's a smaller factor in things. Um, and it's, but I, I'm not the housing planner, so uh, I don't know all the wonks, but it, you know, that and like rental homes, second homes, those are always things that are brought up uh, as, as things people are concerned about. But uh, we have a housing production advisory council now. Our governor is super focused on housing and she's collecting everything. She's throwing all the spaghetti at the wall and seeing, okay, like what's, what can we address? So I, I haven't heard specifically what we're doing about it. It's been raised, but uh, our housing team has not said this is a, co a core problem. Well, yeah, there are a couple of couple of quick things. Uh, one is CFEC, which is what we call it. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, the, the program, uh, it started out strong because different people were around the table. We specifically said, okay, who wants to be on the advisory committee? Open call. Um, submit to us an application and include your demographics. And then we charted it against Oregon's demographics and we said, this, okay, this is who's on it. This represents Oregon. There's someone representing people who are homeless, there are people with disabilities, there are people of color, we're gonna provide stipends. We're gonna change who's in the room and that's fundamentally gonna change the outcomes. And that's key. So we, we very intentionally led with equity because it's an equity program. Um, and when we had public meetings, we said, sign up for the public meeting, provide your demographics, and we'd show up to the public meeting. Okay, just to let you know, 90% of the people here are homeowners and only 60% of Oregon's are. And, you know, we're super white, we're super rich, we're super homeowners. Just think about the people who aren't here as we have this conversation. So that kind of shifted the conversation some, those couple of things. The coalition is, yeah, a, a lot of the politics are just politics that have been going on for 40 years and interesting mixes of coalitions. <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, 
I talked to somebody who uh, was in early conversations about it, um, but I did not follow that closely enough. I feel that, uh, yeah, I, you know, in some ways it was a, a super lot in, in one thing. Like CFAC worked because we're bureaucrats and we're administrators and we have seven commissioners who can do things that aren't necessarily politically easy in a traditional legislature. Like we, we, we in some ways did a lot more than the legislature would do because we had decision makers who were different. So I, I think it's great that the conversation has started. I think it's, it's fascinating to, to, to know what's gonna come back. Clearly crises aren't going to go away. Um, and I think people, you know, that's the nature of legislation. You know, you try it session after session and you adjust it, you get through what you can get through. Um, but I, I'm not an expert enough to know. Um, there was not enough parking reform. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't speak to that uh, more, more in depth. But yeah, we also do have debates about golf courses versus housing so, in Oregon. So lots of similarities. Anyway, so thank you all. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I think, like you note, there's a lot of similarities, so hopefully we've all been able to take away some lessons learned, and I think that that last question probably deserves another couple hours for us to, to chat about as an audience. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our final speaker today uh, for our seventh annual Sustainable Transportation Summit. Um, Senator Faith Winter is going to discuss priorities related to sustainable transportation and land use in Colorado, so she may have some thoughts on that last question as well. Um, Senator Winter was elected to the State Senate in 2018. She represents District 25, which includes portions of Westminster, Broomfield, Thornton, and North Glen. She's currently the chair of the Transportation and Energy Committee, as well as a member of the Health and Human Services Committee. So please join me in welcoming our last speaker, Senator Faith Winter. Good morning, everyone. It is very exciting to see you here. I'm actually... Very short. I get lost behind the podiums. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you to Commuting Solutions for all the work that you're doing. And I look forward to having many, many more conversations as we gear up for the legislative session in January. Um, and I think you... One of the threads that we've seen through all the speakers today is that everything really is connected. We can't talk about transportation without talking about climate. And we can't talk about climate without talking about land use. And we can't talk about land use without talking about transportation and transit and walkability. And so we really have to have these conversations in a holistic way. And I loved the speaker from Oregon um, when he talked about looking at the demographics and looking at, hey, it's actually mostly homeowners here, but 60% of us are renters throughout the state and really grounding ourselves in that equity framework, right? And so we have to talk about land use and climate and transportation within that frame of equity and making sure that we are taking care of disproportionately impacted communities. Um, and we've done a lot. Do you wanna not be tethered? Sure, thanks. Um, and we've done a lot, and I know CDOT's here, um, but they've really taken up the mantle after we passed the environmental justice law in looking at environmental justice and doing mitigation and making sure that the disproportionately impacted communities that have long taken on the burdens of our transportation decisions and land use decisions um, are treated more equity and are benefiting from the changes we're starting to make. And we have to continue that this session. And I don't have all the answers on the housing bill, um, but I, I'm going to own my corner um, in the transit space. And I've started doing stakeholder work, and anyone in here that wants to meet with me about this, I would love to. Please make suggestions. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what I'm working on there, and then I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, so we're looking at transit. So last year, one of the things that we were really looking at in the housing bill was in transit or in corridors, we have to increase density and we have to increase affordability because that's how people get from where they live to where they work, to the doctor, to jury duty, to schools, everything else, right? 
And we know that transit isn't going to work well if we're not actually doing the land use appropriately. And thank you to Deborah. I don't know if she's still here, but RTD is a really important part of that conversation as well. Um, but then, you know, we had tensions with local governments, some of you in this room, about those density and affordability requirements in transit-wearing corridors. And you would come to the legislature and say, well, fine, we'll increase density if we have transit and we have no transit. <laughs> and we, you need to give us more money for transit. Um, and so looking at how we're driving affordability and density has to come with some funding as well. Um, and so how are we funding our transit system? And I'm looking at that in three different ways. First is, how are we spending the money that we have for transit now? So under Senate Bill 260, with, which many of you helped me with, um, we passed uh, and increased our transportation funding to the tune of $5.4 billion over the next 10 years and significantly increased the amount that goes to transit. Um, and I think oftentimes in the metro area, speaking of demographics, everyone just assumes that transit is RTD only. Um, but Colorado actually is more rural transit than any other state in the country, which is something we should be really proud of and continue to support. And so we increase that transit funding under 260. But a lot of you in your local communities don't feel like it's having an impact. You don't feel like it's getting to you. So how are we allocating it? Right? I know Dr. Cog's in the room, right? Working with Dr. Cog to make sure that our transit money is tied with all of the work that our local governments are doing through MPOs. So one is the allocation working. Do we need to statutorily change how we're looking at allocation or change the process of allocation? Second, how do we increase funding? So do we take an increase of funding from the general fund? Do we increase some of the enterprises we have? Do we look at new enterprises? Those are all ideas I want from you, right? So if we're gonna increase transit funding, what does that look like? Then we talk about increasing funding. So now we're getting a little closer, right? So local governments are like, okay, you're actually talking about funding. We can talk more about affordability and density. And then folks say, well, we have to make sure the funding is being spent transparently and to meet all of our goals. And so is the governance, especially of RTD, but I would say governance of our transit agencies across the state, is that governance the right governance, right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it can be changed. Maybe it can be tweaked, right? And how are we doing accountability? How is RTD working with Dr. Cog? How are they How are they involved in the climate plans and land use plans and the growth plans and the air quality plans, right? That we have done at the state level. And so when we're looking at the transportation question, and I started today saying you can't talk about climate without talking about transportation, without talking about land use, without talking about housing. And we need to do that within the equity framework. And so I'm looking and asking for ideas and starting the stakeholder work to say, can we come to the table thinking about equity to achieve these three goals? Account, um, affordability and density in transit-oriented corridors, transit funding, and equity, right? and governance. So can we come together and have that conversation? And I'm not coming with predetermined solutions. Right? There's a lot of local elected officials in this room. There's nonprofit leaders. There's chamber of commerce leaders. Um, there's policy experts. And so I'm saying, here's the goals. Come with me. Bring me your ideas. Thanks. And I would say this conversation also involves air quality. We're clearly in severe non-attainment with no idea how to ever get into attainment. And the transportation sector is our number one polluter. And this, these decisions have to lead us to cleaning our air because people are getting sick, people are dying because we can't get into attainment. We have about 10 minutes. Sure, so within the equity framework, so the first is increased density and affordability in transit or in corridors. 
increase and make sure our transit funding's working. And then make sure that there's accountability and transparency in how we're spending that money with our partners that are receiving that money. Sure. Um, so from some of our other speakers, for example, from Oregon, they talked about having some ex officio members on different boards that bring specific expertise. Um, so I think that's one of the ideas is, um, right, who it, does RTD have the adequate expertise? Let's do that evaluation. And if they don't, how can we help partner from the state level with them to provide that expertise? Um, you know, Deborah talked a lot about data. Um, what data can the state provide in order to partner better with RTD? Um, how is RTD being incorporated into Dr. Cog, right? Because we know that there's local government frustration on the level of service. And Dr. Cog is designed to actually have that ground up approach within the confines of growth plans and air quality and climate and serving the dis disability community, right? All of those things. And I know when I was a city councilor to compete for that transportation money, you had to show regionalism, cooperation, you had to achieve more walkable and livable cities. So how is RTD being incorporated in that? Is there a more in-depth way um, that they could be incorporated on? Um, there's 15 RTD board members. Is that the right number? Are the size of districts the right uh, size? Should there be at large members that are looking at the whole system? Right, um, so I think there's a ton of opportunities, a lot of questions. Um, RTD is one of only three elected transit agency boards in the country. So we are a little bit of an anomaly. So how are we operating within that to ensure we're setting them up for success and we're better serving our communities? Um, so I know, I just uh, moved to Broomfield, and I went from a transit score of 42 at my old house to a score of zero. <laughs> there's no, there's no, absolutely no transit um, anywhere because of service cuts. And so, how are we making sure that we're doing that? And we're also there's a tension within RTD, and I think they would say this too. They are a very large district, so there's a tension of serving populated areas disproportionately impacted communities, employment centers, and also serving such a geographically large area. Let's, ha let's talk about that tension and see what solutions we can come up with. And I just wanna say RTD's been great and I have been meeting with them, so it's not like this, I'm not coming in heavy handed. I'm working with them in partnership and really appreciate the work they do. Absolutely. I'm really excited about all the conversations we had earlier on Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, so I started getting involved in Colorado politics in 2004 as a community organizer on the Fast Tracks campaign. Um, and so I've been working on this for a very long time. And the conversations we're having now are much more tangible. They're positive, they're forward looking. Part of that is because we did create that district. We have provided some state funding. So the state has said, yes, we are invested. We are investing both our time, our money, our resources. We are setting this as a goal. And I think the railroads have come to the table in a way that they haven't in the past. So I'm very optimistic. And we know that when we're moving folks on rail, um, that means less cars on the road. And ultimately, we do have to reduce our vehicle miles traveled um, and figure out what that looks like because that cleans the air. If you are still in a car on the road, you're going to benefit as well from VMTs being reduced, both the climate benefit and the congestion benefit um, and making sure that our air is cleaner. And so moving 
this way, I think is really important. I liked the conversation earlier about early adopters and how are we showing proof in the pudding and showing that this works and showing that we can move this forward. Um, because I think there's a lot of skepticism around if the writership's gonna be there. Um, and we do have the modeling. Um, and sometimes the writership isn't there. Um, but I think starting with those early adopters, really making it accessible, making it work for where people live, and that goes back to the density, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to achieve our climate goals because we cannot electrify our way out of our carbon reduction goals. So the state has done a ton of work on electric vehicle adoption, electric school buses, electric fleet adoption, but we can't just do that. We also have to look at transit. Oh. Excellent. Sure, and I don't, I, I don't have all the answers. Um, I know that we still care very deeply about housing. We still have an affordability crisis. Um, we still have um, a lot of renters. Um, we're still figuring out that equity piece of how we're taking care of renters um, in a way that makes sense. We have a housing shortage. It's not just affordability. We don't have enough housing stock. Um, so that, those conversations are continuing. I know they're continuing with the coalition that started them last year. I know the administration is working very diligently um, on figuring that out going forward. Um, and as the speaker said earlier, that there was a lot in that bill, right? Everything from density and affordability to ADUs. Um, and so I don't know if we'll see kind of that size of a bill again. And I've been working with the administration, and I started this conversation um, and around the transit pieces and those three goals, um, and said, I'm going to be really transparent. I'm going to start talking about it publicly. I'm going to start doing stakeholder meetings. I'm going to meet with my local governments that were upset last year and see where we can get, um, because I think that's going to bring people to the table. And so I at least am driving the transit conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and I and I want to bring up, so what is also making me very optimistic in the transit space right now is the partnerships at all levels of government, um, including organizations like yours. So we have CDOT that has been very successful with bus staying and snow staying, and they're getting ready to expand bus rapid transit. And they're partnering with RTD to make sure RTD is being connected into the, that BRT system. And so you have the state working with the local level. And then there's really exciting things going on in Boulder with nonprofits and private companies on micromobility that's really targeting those other types of trips. And then Bicycle Colorado's here, and they've been a huge partner in really expanding the use of e-bikes across the state. And I think that's going to continue to happen. And we've done so much to incentivize the purchase of e-bikes, but we haven't done enough to increase our bike infrastructure so people feel safe on their e-bikes to do those trips. Um, and so I think that's kind of the next step in terms of um, the e-bike revolution is making sure that we have the infrastructure to match the safety so you do feel safe for recreational trips or trips to the store, or you don't mind putting your kid on a e-bike and sending them to school because you know there's a protected bike lane. You know the lights are working in the way that works for bikers. Um, and so I think that's kind of the next step in working on that. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. I really do appreciate all your work. I've partnered with many of you for many years. Um, so let me know if you want to meet and talk about transit. Let me know what ideas you have. And I look forward to working with you over the next couple months. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Senator Winter. I love the enthusiasm and the comprehensive approach that, that you're taking. Um, and thanks to the audience for your questions today. Um, I'd like to take this moment as we conclude to thank our 2023 sponsors um, for their generous support with, with which this event wouldn't be possible. So a big thank you to our 2023 presenting sponsors, Boulder County, the city of Boulder, and the city and county of Broomfield. Also a big thanks to our gold sponsors, Colorado Transportation Investment Office, RTD, the Northwest Chamber Alliance, Google, Sterling Bay, and Elevations Credit Union. Finally, thank you to our silver and nonprofit sponsors. Commuting Solutions really does appreciate your support. I'd also like to give a shout out to Commuting Solutions staff for all their work um, and their ability to transition with technical challenges. And finally, a thank you um, to our audience for participating. And I'll just close by saying, Commuting Solution envisions a region with a rich blend of state-of-the-art multimodal travel options accessible to and well utilized by everyone who calls our region home. We work to hasten the day when transportation no longer contributes to climate change. We hope that you leave the Longmont Museum and Cultural Center today with a more hopeful outlook and a greater understanding of the exciting prospects of large scale rail uh, development in Colorado and ways in which sustainable transportation can bring people together. So with that, I'll conclude. Thanks again for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.